College of Surgeons, UICC Global Cancer Control, ABC Global Alliance, Philippine Society of Breast Surgeons, Philippine Society of Medical everyone and welcome to day two of the sixth Southeast Asian Breast Cancer Symposium. Now let's all welcome Miss Chrisanne Sodran. Good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the day two of the sixth Southeast Asia Breast Cancer Symposium, the first of its kind here in the country. There isn't anyone in this room or anyone attending online today that has not been touched by breast cancer. Breast cancer continues to affect those diagnosed, their families, their circle of support, their communities. As Bibeth, who opened yesterday's conference, said, when one is diagnosed, the family gets cancer. The entire community gets cancer. This symposium is a special opportunity to call attention to the breast cancer issues to discuss new findings, new approaches, to acknowledge the obstacles that lie ahead, and to come together for a united cause. It is our hope that because of, through, and beyond this, we can ultimately speak with one regional, powerful, collective voice. This three-day conference is made possible by the support of our sponsor partners who share and believe in our advocacy. Without you, this would have been unimaginable. Thank you, Pfizer. Roche, AIA Philippines, Novartis, the Degusman Group, NutriAsia, Unilab, In the Pink, Healthway, Globe, and SEDA. We would also like to acknowledge our partner organizations, ABC Global Alliance, American Society of Clinical Oncology, Cancer Coalition Philippines, Philippine Society of Breast Surgeons, Philippine Society of Medical Oncology, Philippine Society of Oncologists, Reach to Discovery International, Shui Yong Hinin C Cancer Foundation, Swan Dok Breast Cancer Network, and Yayasan Kanker Payudara, Indonesia. Thank you, sponsors. Hand in hand with all of you, we have already taken the first steps to designing a better future for the global breast cancer community. We would also like to extend our gratitude to our speakers, our moderators, and our reactors. You have gifted us 
with your invaluable time, knowledge, and expertise. Breast cancer remains to be a crucial health concern that impacts us here in the Philippines, in Southeast Asia, and all over the world. Yesterday, we learned the sobering and eye-opening facts that breast cancer is top one cancer in 157 countries. It is the leading cause of cancer-related deaths in 110 out of 115 countries. There were 2.3 million newly diagnosed in 2020 alone. By 2030, 75% of the projected 2.2 million new breast cancer cases and 817,000 new cases annually will occur in lower middle income countries. Here in the Philippines, breast cancer is the leading cause of death and the number one cancer in the country. Nevertheless, the Global Breast Cancer Initiative aims to reduce global breast cancer mortality by 2.5% per year until 2040. This will save 2.5 million lives over a 20-year period. We pondered the question, why are we only measuring suffering and not happiness? We also learned of the extraordinary benefits of peer mentoring. This very city where we are now broadcasting from, Taguig, is home to a highly successful breast cancer control program called Ating Dibdibigin, made possible through local legislation and a 10-year strong partnership with I Can Serve and the local government. Yesterday's session highlighted the importance of institutionalizing programs such as this so that they can outlast changes in leadership and overpower politics. What a privilege to be in the room with our esteemed doctors who took to the stage to discuss findings from 2022 American Society of Clinical Oncology annual meeting. In what seemed to me like a gathering of my favorite Marvel characters banding together to combat the threats that arise, our superheroes, our panelists, presented recent studies while emphasizing putting patient care at the forefront. And that is their superpower. Here's a glimpse of what transpired yesterday. CBCS or CVAX is back, kinda in person and not so in person. We need a revolution in cancer care in the way we think, imagine, and in the way we get things done. Today we have resource speakers from 14 countries participating in person and online. Peer support has so many benefits. It can decrease feelings of isolation, encourage positive emotional states, and improve patient coping responses and behaviors. Patients who received the TDXD lived longer, on average of about six and a half months longer than those who were randomized to get just standard chemotherapy. The project aims to increase awareness of breast cancer, self-examination breast health, and to promote clinical breast examination among the primary healthcare providers to help downstaging the breast cancer cases in the area. The goal is to get 80% of patients through treatment without abandoning. Many don't know which countries belong to Southeast Asia. We need to come together define ourselves, and project our uniqueness. We have to speak louder so the world gets to know us, and we can help the future of cancer care. Today is another special day. Before we start with today's sessions, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our next speaker. She has had an extensive career serving public office for almost three decades. She held the role of Health Secretary of the Philippines from 2016 to 2017. Prior to that, she served as the Assistant Secretary at the Department of Health's Office of Technical Services and Office for Health Regulations. Those in the Cancer Coalition Philippines, of which I can serve as a founding member, remember fondly how when the Secretary of Health then, they called hoping she could provide the backing they needed for the cancer bill. They will never forget that they needed, that the backing they needed was acted on immediately. She called and readily arranged a meeting with the legislative team to show her full support. She's not just an ally 
but a true champion for the cancer cause. Please welcome Secretary Pauline Obial. Hello and good day to everyone who are cancer global community of breast cancer warriors. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure for me to join you today in this significant uh, conference. The first time I believe in two years that we come together on a face-to-face -face and a hybrid of virtual um, online speakers. It is really the new normal or the thing that uh, we have to live with after the pandemic is that things change and we have to adapt to the current world standards. So I'd like to congratulate, first of all, the organizers of this uh, conference, hybrid conference, our um, local counterpart, uh, Ms. Kara Magsanok Alik. Pala, the chairperson of the Southeast Asia Breast Cancer um, Conference, and Caroline Taylor, the co-founder and co-chairperson of this Southeast Asian Breast Cancer uh, Symposium. And uh, I'd like to give a message to everyone that health is actually everybody's concern, and that was my battle cry when I was health secretary, all for health towards health for all, meaning that health should not be just the concern of healthcare providers or the health sector, but everyone in the community must be involved in uh, ensuring health and well-being of everyone else in the community. And this dictum or advocacy holds true for cancer as well as other diseases. So it was my um, advocacy also when I was health secretary to champion the cancer bill and also to provide support to our cancer control program. I remember in 1998 when I was head of the Women's Health and Safe Motherhood Project, we did, um, we did a community survey on why women will not go for breast cancer screening. And majority of the women answered that they would rather not know that they have breast cancer because they believe they cannot provide the financial uh, support or resources in a, uh, to enable them to get treatment. So why will you get screened if you cannot get treated? So with that in mind, I really tried to push the Department of Health and I think it's also what we need to do in other countries, particularly the third world and uh, uh, growing economies to push the government to provide resources especially for cancer treatment, because like many of you know, and now we have the data, breast cancer is one of the treatable cancers, meaning that if you find it early and you provide treatment and management early, it can go away. It's a cancer that can be treated. So I hope that we work together uh, and ensure that governments are held accountable and provide resources for our cancer patients and the cancer network. It's not just about treatment, it's also providing support to cancer patients and of course, survivors. Only this week, I'd like to also make mention that cancer is very close to my heart, uh, because a classmate of mine had a um, mastectomy uh, only this week, and another classmate in high school who has had her mastectomy last year had to have the other breast 
removed this week because of metastasis. So breast cancer and uh, how it affects all of us is a real issue in our times. And we have to take note that it takes a community. It takes all of us working together to help our breast cancer patients. So with that, I congratulate everyone and I uh, advocate to all of you to continue working together, learn from each other because that's the way we advance the science, management, and treatment of uh, breast cancer as well as other diseases. It's a community working together for the betterhood of all peoples of the world. So congratulations to the global breast cancer community for this wonderful symposium of advancing our knowledge on breast cancer treatment and support. Click on the corresponding rooms via our virtual site. There's a help desk if you need any assistance. Take advantage of that chat button. We would love to hear from you. As Kara, my comrade, said, everything big begins small. It is time to think out of the box. It is time to banish barriers and fears. We hope this will be another day of learning, of empowering, of strengthening this community. Thank you. To our guests attending the breakout rooms, you may now proceed to your respective rooms. Once again, to our guests attending the various breakout rooms, you may proceed to your respective rooms now. Thank you.
Just exit the session, refresh your browser, and log back in again. There are different rooms for different sessions. Please make sure to check the schedule posted on our Facebook page and on our official website to help you choose what sessions to attend. If you have questions about the sessions and or your viewing experience, feel free to approach our virtual help desk and one of our staff members will assist you. Thank you so much.
To start our first session, let's all welcome our moderator, Ms. Ranjit Kaur. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to be a moderator for this session. It's a very interesting topic this time. The, big, the other big C on the darker side of cancer. And we have two interesting presentations. And I'm going to be moderating the session. Joining me as our reactor is Max Ventura uh, of the AIA Philippines ESG consultant. Would like you to take a seat over there. Thank you. A reminder to all who are listening, if you have any questions during the Q&A session, please do put in your questions in the chat box and we will get the speakers to answer. For this session, we will delve into the grit that comes with the battle. We'll talk about cost or cash, as some people put it. I would say cost, the other big C on the darker side of cancer. And presented by Dr. Nirmala Bhupati and Dr. Karazon Nilangyal. Please do pay attention. You will have some interesting insights into cost or the other big C on the darker side of cancer. So may I invite Dr. Nirmala Bhupati to give her presentation. Please give a big hand. A very good evening. Thanks for the invitation again. I feel very honored to be here. It was fun. And um, this topic is very close to my heart because this is where I started realizing that rather than clinical outcomes, there's a lot of things that we can do to improve patient-centered outcomes. And that's because I had the honor of um, being the principal investigator for the ASEAN Cost in Oncology Study. And that's how I started moving towards patient advocacy and fighting for things which are important to patients and their families. Can I have my slide, please? So while we wait for the slides, I think a common term, in the, in the past, we used to talk about toxicity of treatments, and therefore we say cancer treatment, toxicity, and so on. And soon after, there was a new term that was coined, financial toxicity. And uh, financial toxicity was initially thought to be a result of cancer treatment. But when we looked at what happened and what we found in the ASEAN cost in oncology study and a myriad of studies elsewhere, we realized that the cost is not necessarily due to cancer treatment alone. It starts from the point of diagnosis. Hence, we started saying that financial toxicity refers to the bad effects or the complications, financial complications of being diagnosed with cancer. Are we ready with the slide? Can we start? Oh, that's the wrong slide. Okay, while well, they wait to start that, um, I think today what we'll be doing is, uh, like Ranjit has rightly pointed out, it's not just cash, but more like cost. And why do we say that? It's because patients have to fork out cash out of their pocket, but they also suffer from indirect costs. And what are those indirect costs? Loss of productivity and um, loss of income. And that's also a big component something that was not something that we found in the action study, we were not able to show that. Uh, so I'm here to share insights on what are the other costs that we incur, in, that, that is incurred by patients and their families and caregivers as a whole. Just like I think we are reiterating what has been said before, when there is cost, the cost is not only for the patient, but for the entire household. The entire household suffers and it impacts the family's future because they are using up their savings and so on. Ranjit, maybe while waiting for the slides, we can have some discussion. Yeah. 
we won't waste any time, but maybe we can ask you a question. When you say cost, and it's there are some hidden costs that you were mentioning, would you particularly want to uh, sort of list down what are the hidden costs that you think you would recognize as? Um, actually, some of it has been uh, revealed through our qualitative inquiries with patients. So what we found in action study was all numbers, and, and we felt that some things were missing. So with the, with the qualitative inquiries, we begin to realize that even when we talk about cancer treatment, if the cancer treatment is provided at low cost, for instance, chemotherapy, the recurring, recurring payments and the recurring need to uh, move to the hospital and going back can be detrimental for families, not only because they need to spend, but also they lose time from work and also for the caregivers. Caregivers are impacted. We never measure those things. Caregivers get affected far worse than what we can imagine. And only in recent times, we have began realizing that caregivers, uh, we need to also pay attention to caregivers. So, so those are the, the, uh, the, the long-term and recurrent need for payment, but also for supportive items like wigs, breast prosthesis. These are never covered in the insurance system in many places, you know, and, and, and uh, the government... Okay, also now we we'll talk about the other big C. It's the wrong one. What we can do, I think we can, um, I can, I can speak because whatever that Ranjit has said is very much related to what we did with the qualitative inquiry. So I'll tell you all the story. So we did action study and then we realized there were a lot of details which were missing, which is needed because we need to do, come up with some actionable solutions instead of always highlighting the problem. So we got together and gathered a group of people with cancer not only people with breast cancer, but also cervical cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, more than a hundred of them, all qualitative inquiries. So it's loads and loads of conversations, but it was so meaningful and we gathered a lot of useful information from there. So when we looked at costs, generally there were the direct medical costs, and these are things that we can always imagine, you know, like uh, going to the hospital, paying for consultations, paying for surgeries, treatments, but the, the thing about this treatment is sometimes we don't realize that for surveillance, when patients need to be on follow-up for recurrence, there's this cost for imaging. And these are things that often are missed out. So people keep on having to spend those things and some of it cannot be claimed from insurance and it comes out of pocket. And then when we move on to indirect medical costs, uh, let me move to non-health costs. Non-health costs is very important. Again, when we talk about health systems, health systems are not really responsible for the non-health costs. And therefore, it is often missed off. And non-health costs includes things like, you know, getting food, getting uh, transported to the hospital, getting someone to look after the children while the mom is sick, or getting look, someone to look after the parents. So there are a lot of elements that are missed when we just focus on cancer therapies and hospital-based care. So, and we find that even in settings where there is universal health coverage, meaning that a lot of treatment is provided at highly subsidized costs. Yep. Going back to the uh, non-health uh, non costs. So we realize that non-health costs is often missed and no one advocates for non-health costs. And, and I think it's very, very important, especially in women with breast cancer. Because what is uh, something that is accessible for women with uh, resources, for instance, a mastectomy bra, maybe something that is out of reach for another woman. And it's not that they do not want it. It's because they can't afford it. And these are the stories that we heard from our patients. And we thought that it's so important to highlight them because often these are things that no one tells. It's the untold stories, right? And um, in, uh, in terms of non-indirect uh, costs, that's where it becomes interesting because whether a person is poor or rich or well-educated or not less well-educated, 
the fact that they lose productivity, the fact that they have to take medical leave, unpaid medical leave, because most of our countries, we do not offer very long-term cancer leave. This is again very much related to employment and, and, and employers, and it is not related to health systems. So again, so the, the problem is all of us are working in our own sectors. And when we work in our own sectors, you don't see the other problem or we feel that, how am I going to change that? And that's how I think the link there is the patients and the patient support groups, because it's easier for us to link to all of you and all of you link with link us back with the other stakeholders, you know, like how Mark Max is here today, you know, like, so, so usually we don't directly speak to each other, but it's because of a common interest of helping patients. So those are the indirect costs that we, we, we felt that is often missed out and people don't quantify them. In recent times, they've started quantifying, counting, you know, when people get cancer, what is the indirect cost? What is the indirect cost for the patients, but also what's the indirect cost for employers? Only when we do that, people start paying attention. And, and we are not only talking about people who go to work and, uh, or people who don't go to work. That's much easier to calculate. It's much difficult to calculate when people go to work and they don't give their full ability because they are less productive. They are too sick from chemo or they have uh, problems remembering things or they're too weak. They, are, they can't use their arms and things like that. So those are the things which we call as presenteeism. People are present, but they are unable to provide. So these are things that need to be calculated and that, that's where the actionable solutions can come in and we need multi-sectoral um, collaboration to work on it. So health systems alone cannot deal with the big C when it comes to cancer. Ranjit, do you wanna add anything or say anything? Okay, if, if that's the case, then I think we will invite Dr. Cora, right? Uh, you want to introduce Dr. Cora? Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Nirmala, for this uh, very uh, succinct information on health costs and non-health costs. We will now play the um, presentation by Dr. Nelang Nel, uh, and uh, she would also explain the other aspect of costs when it comes to uh, cancer. Thank you. Okay, now we talk about the other big C on the dark side of cancer, cash. Funding finances is a peso. The Philippine Cost in Oncology or PESO study described the economic impact of cancer on Filipino cancer patients using the ASEAN Cost in Oncology Action study set, data set. And it concluded that cancer can be a significant economic burden for Filipinos leading to financial catastrophe. Insurance mechanisms at the time of the study failed to protect against catastrophe. The PESO study included 909 patients, 58% female, 75% married, mean age about 52 years, 76% had secondary or higher education, 46% were household heads, 32% spouses of the head, and 40% had no insurance at all. And those with insurance had, um, most of them had field health insurance, some had employment-based insurance, uh, private insurance, and community insurance. At baseline, 
Roughly 43% belong to the two lowest income brackets. And at the end of the follow-up study, 63% belong to the, this income bracket. So there is an increase in patients going into the lowest income brackets. Across the 12 months periods, a period about 51% had a decrease in income with 25% falling to the lowest income bracket. 35% had no chance change, had no change in income and 14% had an increase in income. Belonging to higher income groups was significantly associated with lower risk of financial catastrophe. Insurance did not confer significant change in risk of death or financial catastrophe. At 12 months, the proportion of households who earned their income, such as crops, agriculture, sidelines, family businesses, and wage, decreased compared to baseline from 75% to from 85% to 76%, while households who received income through remittances and gifts increased from 14% to 23%. There was also a change in types of employment with decreases in individuals involved in professional and sales and work corresponding increase in people involved in elementary occupations. There was a decrease in doing paid work and also doing housework. Now, what did the patients do to find funds for their treatment? From up diagnosis to month 12 follow-up, <coughs> they sought assistance from family and friends, obtained loans, used their savings, sought financial assistance from government, and sold their assets. So from the action study and the PESO study, what has changed for the country since? The NICA, the National Integrated Cancer Control Act was signed by President R. Duterte in 2019. In 2018, during a debate in the Philippine Senate, Senator Sarah, Sunny Angara, a co-sponsor of the, of the NICA, drew on the findings of the action study to highlight the urgency of immediately passing the bill into law. This was a key factor leading to the quick and successful passage of the NICA within the year. The NICA is widely seen a significant first step in the transformation of cancer care across all levels of the Philippine health systems. So the NICA Republic Act 112151 was approved in February 14, 2019. It is an act institutionalizing a national integrated cancer control program and appropriating funds thereof. The most important words there is appropriating funds thereof. So in section 20, there is a provision for establishment of cancer assistance funds to support the cancer medicine and treatment assistance program. The DOH shall manage the fund in accordance with existing budgeting, accounting, and auditing rules and regulation and shall make a quarterly, quarterly report to the Office of the President and Congress. In Section 21, Bill health benefits for cancer was mandated. Phil health shall expand its benefit packages to include primary care screening, detection, diagnosis, treatment assistance, supportive care, survivorship, follow-up care, rehabilitation, and end of life for all types and stages of cancer, both in adults and children. Section 22, look at social protection mechanisms. The DOH in collaboration with SSS, GSIS, 
Philippine Charity Sweepstakes, DOLE, DSWD, PhilHealth, and LGU shall develop appropriate and easily accessible social protection mechanisms for cancer patients, people living with cancer, cancer survivors, their families, and carers. It shall aim to encourage the underprivileged and marginalized people living with cancer to undergo the necessary treatment care. In section 32, it discontained the appropriations, the funding for this program cancer control program, the amount needed for the initial implementation of this act, including maintenance and other operating expenses, shall be charged against the current year's appropriations of DOH. For the succeeding years, the amount allocated for the NICA in DOH budget shall be based on strategic plan formulated by the cancer and the council has already approved the 2020-2030 strategic action plan for cancer in the Philippines. The amount should be in the national expenditure program as basis for the General Appropriations Act. This figure summarizes the oncology fund flow in the Philippines. Sources of funds come from the government, PCSO, PAGCOR, Syntax Revenue, Central and Local Government Revenues. These are pooled going to DOH, PhilHealth, Local Health Units, funding the whole cancer control continuum. While the UHC Act and NICA mandate an increase in resources for health and cancer control, the guidelines on transition and interagency transfers from revenues of government owned and controlled corporations have not been released. In the PESOL study, no significant impact. Now we look at the field health as it is one of the major sources of funding for the cancer control program. In the PESO study, there is no significant impact of having insurance on financial catastrophe. It could be inadequate benefit package or support value given to the insurance scheme at the time. At the time, the insurance was under case rate system and covered only admissions, surgeries, and radiotherapy sessions. At the time of the PESO study data collection, the say benefit package covered on the limited number of cancers and the impact of the program. The program existed at the time of the study and covered all direct medical expenses, hospitalization, medicines, health services. It is estimated that the number of individuals who experience catastrophic spending would increase by 22% or from, would decrease by 22% or from 369 to 286 individuals uh, if uh, the safe package at the time could have covered all direct medical expenses. We look at the, the Philippine Insurance Corporations, the PhilHealth safe packages in providing financial risk protection and um, after the PESO study, and the conclusion was that the SAE benefit program was successful in reducing patient expenses and lowering the odds of financial catastrophe only during the first year of treatment. This may be sufficient for conditions with short treatment, but not for diseases warranting longer periods, such as breast cancer, for example. Finding support the continuation and expansion of the program with consideration for increasing coverage periods for selected conditions. In the PESO study, we documented that the insurance has been, can provide protection versus catastrophic disease insurance has been has been documented to provide protection against catastrophic disease in other studies. Healy 
et al. concluded that the health insurance protects against catastrophic expenditure among acute stroke patients in China. Cook et al. found that elderly women, elderly, among the elderly in the U.S. who experienced major diseases, including cancer and stroke, there was a median asset decrease of around 50% among newly ill uninsured compared to much newly ill insured elderly. Min and Tran found that in rural Vietnam, having one household member with an insurance card was significantly protective against catastrophic health expenditure and impoverishment. Lastly, in Korea, Kim and Kon observed that financial catastrophe among cancer patients decreased when cancer was included in the coverage plan. Now, from the action study, the one that the, the whole region ASEAN, what has changed for your country since? The ASEAN Cost in Oncology Action Study of the George Institute for Global Health and ASEAN countries, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam, followed 9,514 cancer patients across 41 sites and revealed that 75% of them died or had suffered a financial catastrophe because their medical costs exceeded 30% of their annual household income. Diagnosis at a more advanced stage led to patients being five times more likely to die within 12 months. This test could have been averted through adequate investment in primary care, primary health care and cancer care. So in the past years, the action study had helped improve cancer care policy and priorities across Asia, such as the NICA in the Philippines. Dr. Hashbola Trabrani in Indonesia said that in Indonesia, there has been a good progress in covering cancer treatments in our national health insurance scheme, but it's still insufficient coverage. Economically, there has been much less prevalence of impoverished people who are suffering from can any cancer in Indonesia. Cancer has been the second largest amount of claims in our NHI, National Health Insurance, after CBD. The next question is in the Philippines. What solutions can the patients turn to when government can no longer provide? So lifting these um, this private uh, sources of uh, private fundings from uh, one slide uh, I showed you a while back. So private uh, employer, employer coverage, employer uh, insurance, private insurance, HMOs, life insurances, donor funds, NGOs, cancer-related NGOs, and individual and household funds. So again, they would use the funding, seek, seek assistance from family, friends, obtain loan, sell assets. However, in the individual and household funds, the out-of-pocket expenditure should be less than 20% of household health expense expenditure so that the family would not go into financial catastrophe. The private health insurance and the cancer-related NGO funding are also very limited. So government has to step in from the Hope From Within organization, uh, these were listed as governments who would be helping cancer patients in the Philippines. And the cancer patients and the public have to go to them, have to nug them. DOH Medical Assistance Program, PC, uh, PCSO, Individual Medical Assistance Program, DSW, assistance to individuals in crisis. PAGCOR also provides medical assistance. The Office of the Vice President also uh, uh, provides assistance. Senate of the Philippines 
and the House of Representatives also offer assistance. We just have to go to them and knock them. The LGU offices, Office of the Mayor, the Governors, also Congressmen, uh, aside from the Congressmen, the House of Representative, Representatives can also offer financial assistance. Thank you. May I now invite um, Dr. Corazon Mingaleo for, to come up and join me on stage along with Dr. Nirmala Bhuputi. We now come to the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, you can ask and uh, we will get the speakers to answer. And my colleague, uh, Max Ventura, will also be he here to be the reactor uh, um, for the session. Are there any questions from the floor? It can't be silence. It's a very important topic. Hi, uh, my name is Ting Ting Zhang. Uh, I, I had worked in, uh, in China for some of these access to medicine issues. One question I had uh, in, in regarding all of this is, uh, is there access to clinical trials that can alleviate some of the costs associated with treatment? Or this is a different scenario? Uh, we didn't get your question. Could you repeat and louder a bit? Uh, so uh, can patient without with limited financial resources access to uh, ongoing clinical trials uh, dr milanga do you want to answer that yes um yes uh, patients do have access to clinical trials uh in the philippines i think uh, also in <laughs> in um country but i'm talking about the philippines yes there are uh, we do have, but it really depends on um, on the lung cancer side. Currently, the clinical trials ongoing in the Philippines are on breast, lung, lymphoma, melanoma, what else? But and uh, this is situated mainly in the big uh, centers in Metro Manila. Uh, there are also there's also one or two in Baguio City, in Cebu, in Dabao in Iloilo. So yes, uh, patients do have access on clinical trials. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yes, uh, may Ann? May Ann Solomon from I Can Serve and Cebu based. Um, I'd like to do a follow up question, Doctor. Nothing was mentioned about Malasakit. Now in Cebu, some of our um, women they go to PCSO, but then they are directed to Malasakit. And in the presentation, we do not see any mention of Malasakit. Please it, clarify. I, Malasakit is basically a separate funding source from government. Uh, okay. So we kind of connect it to the NICA law. In, in NICA, they have this cancer assistance fund currently, which uh, they also get some funds from Malasakit. Yeah, you get it? Malasakit kasi is operating in, um, in mainly in hospitals. Yeah. And it's it actually uh, serves uh, patients uh, without with low resource. Any kind of disease, it can be cancer, it can be... Um, hypertension, it can be diabetes, and uh, patients with cancer can go to them and also ask for assistance on medications, diagnostics, uh, uh, whatever actually, uh, as long as they are in the hospital where they are asking for in the Malasakit offices. Okay, not all government hospitals has a Malasakit office. Thank you for that. Um, 
Max, is there anything you would like to say about uh, the, have there been any changes in terms of insurance with the introduction of the act that happened in 2019 uh, from your perspective? Yeah. Okay. So first of all, good afternoon to everyone. I'm really very happy to have been invited in this uh, session because this is actually an intersection of two things I'm very passionate about, uh, financial literacy and health and wellness, particularly in the battle against cancer, having had family and my wife deal with the, uh, with the disease. No? So I think I just would like to react to the statements and then go to the question of uh, uh, Ranjit. So uh, essentially, what we would like to look at this is in terms of risk uh, mitigation. So one of the best tools for us in terms of risk mitigation would be to have some sort of insurance. No? And that's, that's what we have tried to develop as a company so that we can uh, deliver on our brand promise of healthier, longer, better lives. So insurance plays a big role in terms of uh, ba uh, battling the disease and lessening the impact, the negative impact of uh, draining your financial resources. So, but then a step before that would be really trying to understand your basic uh, financial uh, well-being and we've been doing some trainings and it, it's come it comes as a surprise to many of our countrymen that the formula for saving is really income minus your savings equals your expense because more often than not we operate in income less expense whatever is left is savings and more often than not there's no savings left so savings generation I think is an important tool in terms of mitigating the risk in, in the event that you do have to battle with cancer. Then the next question is, if we say that cash is king, I'd like to think that care is his queen consort. Because if you care for something, then you will put the resources for that. Uh, so, so then at the, at the micro level, for example, say for example, there are tests now that genetic hereditary tests that gives you an idea of whether you run the risk of getting cancer, it costs about 20 to 40,000 pesos. You drink Starbucks, you get 200 easily in a visit, you get six, 60 days, that's 6,000. If you cut by half your consumption, then you set aside funds to do the test, and that helps you navigate your health and well being. How will you deal with, with the future? Now, at the macro level, and this is where I think we can try to address the questions raised by Nirmala about the indirect cost, how it impacts the patient. In our case, as a government, and I'm glad that uh, Dr. Akora mentioned about the National Integrated Cancer Control Law, which allocates or sets aside the cancer, uh, special cancer fund. However, in our budget this year, that 500 million was taken out of the national expenditure program. So where will we get the funding to assist the patients? But then we get an office of the vice president that gets 500 million for confidential intelligence funds. So I'm saying, why not realign that and put it to where it counts if we care? No? And precisely, that's what I'm um, advocating for, that to battle this issue on cash and the cost, I'd like to offer three C's as well. Us, citizens, if we, our cancer patients in particular, coalesce, we, we form our uh, alliances, and then we campaign, we advocate for our cause, and especially in the budget of our government now. Because that's where pri primarily the bulk of the cash should be coming from. We already have our universal health care, and that should be funded, and the cash should be coming from government, from our taxes. So that's what I'd like to, to just share no, and react, because ultimately government will be able to address the indirect, address, help address the indirect costs as well. And, and insurance would play a big role, as was mentioned in your study, Doctora. Because, you know, I mean, in my case, I was paying for the premium. I haven't fully paid, but my wife had cancer and we were given the, the cancer assistance because I got the cancer rider on her policy. And, and that's for a, a segment of our population. But for those who 
are on the marginalized sector, I think government has the role to play, and that's where I think the cash should be coming from. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much for the clarity. Um, I would like to now, for the last couple of minutes, I would like to ask, ask Dr. Karazan and also uh, Dr. Nirmala to just give your burning recommendation of how to overcome this whole issue of, as what Max says, cash is king. I say cost is an issue. It's an important issue, far more important than just being in the Department of Health beyond that. So if you could just give us a sh short remark to conclude this session. Yes, sir. Um, I think uh, we've, there's a lot of talks about the need for governments to step in, do more and stuff like that. So I wouldn't get there. I thought that uh, I would like to focus to something that's very close to my heart, a result of what we found from action study and all the other subsequent studies that we did. And we think that financial navigation is a very important area that needs to be addressed. And it's not new. Financial nav patient navigation is not new. But financial navigation is a little bit different from patient navigation because patient navigation is very general. And financial navigation has the opportunity to direct patients, counsel patients, connect them to financial resources, and also do more than just connecting patients to resources, but also support those who are even high income and middle income because they need financial planning advice, they need debt consolidation advice, and these are things that financial navigation services can, can do. And in the US, there's a lot of financial navigation programs which are ongoing. In Asia, we have none, and it has to be tailored to the local setting. I think that's the most important. You cannot adopt from US and try to do it here. Our health system differ the way things... So we have to start, and it has to be a co-design approach where investigators, academics work with the patient support groups and, and so on to come up with a, a program that works. Not too ambitious, start small and move on and big, big up, uh, build up a bigger financial navigation program. I think that Thank will you. be my Thank you, my Dr. Take. Kara. Yeah, okay. For the Philippines, uh, actually, the Nikalo is... If you read it, it's really fantastic. And uh, the IRR that was made for the NICALO also gave more details on how to implement the NICALO. Now, we have to make government, particularly Department of Health, and at the back of the Department of Health is the Department of Budget Management because they're the ones sometimes at odds with DOH to be able to come up with funds to fund whatever is mandated in the law. And whatever is in the IRR, as I said, it, it really reads uh, perfectly. <laughs> I was in a member of the IRR committee. Menchi uh, Osti is here. He's also a member. So, he's, so it's, it's really nice, except that DOH must must do what the IRR has uh, has uh, mandated and they have signed it, it the, their secretary has signed it so it must be implemented you know sentence by sentence word by word paragraph by paragraph and they cannot question anything that is there because this is signed by the secretary of health himself Okay, so meaning to say, please implement what is in the IRR. Now, for the Filipino citizens, um, the field health insurance, <laughs> the the public health insurance actually is 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 fine. And uh, what I know is field health is now kind of strengthening whatever it is there for uh, for the cancer patients and we have to wait the problem with the waiting is it takes time and uh, so uh, we we waited 30 years for the nika law to come into into a law we can wait not 30 years for for feel health to really uh, fatten up uh, the um, the packages for cancer patients, but the thing is Filipinos, all Filipinos must indeed enroll themselves in, in the field health because it does help when you get sick. Thank you very much.
And uh, with this, I would like to wrap up by saying the conclusion, the conclusion of this session is one, financial navigation, two, uh, don't look just at the Department of Health, you just can't be knocking on the door of the Department of Health, but the budget that is by the Ministry of Health or the Department of, of Finance, that's where you need to start from because you need to get the allocation from there and the Department of Health needs our help as well for that. With that, I would like to say thank you to my speakers and also to my fellow reactor, Max. And thank you to everyone for listening today. We had a good session. And with that, I end this session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of our attendees. We are happy to see you here today. Please don't forget to share your SEA BCS 2022 experience on social media and use these hashtags. Hashtag better future for breast cancer. Hashtag SEA BCS 2022. Hashtag SEA BCS Philippines. And hashtag SEA BCS Manila.
so much, Dr. Christine, for this very interesting session. I was thinking back to the time when I was going through chemotherapy and it really resonated a lot of what you shared. But let me bring into the conversation our two specialists. We have Dr. Um, Edwin and Dr. Christian, who are both oncologists. And uh, before we take other questions, I'd like to give them a little time to share their insights about what you shared and maybe contextualize it to the Southeast Asian region in the Philippine setting. Maybe we can hear first from Dr. Edwin. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Christine, for that very, uh, uh, very uh, insightful discussion. Uh, it's very relevant in, in our, you know, practice. Uh, yeah. For me, when I see patients, uh, I always, uh, especially if they're going to embark on a chemotherapy journey, I always tell them, remember uh, uh, five, uh, the ABCs or ABC of uh, chemotherapy preparedness. I tell them that. But it's A, B, A assessment. You, you get your, you know, write a journal, uh, write a diary, and then put them the history, your physical, uh, any medication you're taking and all those side effects you're, uh, you're experiencing. And, and uh, during the treatment and put there all those questions that you wanna ask your doctors so that you can, you know, have that communication. And B is a behavioral change. So you, you, you know, stop smoking, uh, eat healthier, yeah. Do the physical examination like those exercise yeah. and then see counseling. So you have to, you know, uh, uh, get a, sometimes get a professional, uh, like a psychiatrist or psychologist, or maybe a support group, you know, uh, join a uh, 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 that I can serve, like support group. Uh, and uh, D, uh, drug modification, pharmacologic modification, of course, it's part of. All of these side effects, sometimes it's oral drugs or prophylactic treatments or some treatments again. And then last is education. You have to, you know, try to read more on your, your problem, your, your disease and your cancer and the different management that you can offer. Now, I remember one patient of mine, he, he says that uh, education brings understanding and understanding brings hope. And uh, in your talk, uh, you, brought, you brought hope and understanding. <laughs> Doctor, yeah. thank you. I think it's a good one that you're talking about this uh, uh, the ABCDE, but yeah. I think uh, I'm pretty sure that not all the physicians do that. Yeah. You got one, you're a great one. I think our uh, friend mentioned that one of the uh, concerns is that you just have this uh, pieces of information. You said to me very early in the talk that uh, for, for people who get the diagnosis of cancer, uh, it really takes a little bit of time for everything to take in. So yeah. what you're having this information can help uh, people who really can understand the illness. Can we hear from Dr. Christian? Hello, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Christine also for that very interesting discussion on managing unwelcome side effects of cancer treatment. I would have to agree with Dr. Edwin Tan. Uh, I, got, I get a lot of good uh, thoughts and points from him when I was in my fellowship training. So in the Philippine setting as well, we also share the same experiences with Dr. Christine. We have a lot, we encounter a lot of treatment-related side effects from our traditional modalities of cancer treatment, chemotherapy, <clears throat> radiation, and surgery. And now that uh, as medical oncologists, we, uh, we are now in a more personalized uh, medicine. Of course, we have a lot of other systemic treatments at hand, not only chemotherapy, but we also have your biologics and your targeted treatments, which also have their own uh, side effects. So it is really uh, important that, that we focus more, that more attention should be focused on proactively monitoring this treatment-related side effects. I totally agree. And um, to help people to understand how to do it in a better way, I always tell them I turn it around. I can't do it with everybody, but most people, most patients can have it. I always ask them, do you want to complete your treatment or, or do you want to, uh, to stop early? And they say, of course, I want to complete the treatment. And I tell them, when you are not telling us the side effects that you experience, we have to take you off your treatment. 
So you need to be aware of it, that you tell them as, uh, as quickly as possible and share with us what you're trying to do to get them in control, because otherwise we have to, to stop. Do you understand that? And they say, yes, now I understand, I have to tell it. And what I do is make the, the partner who's coming into the office, I make him or his, uh, her responsible. I'm always saying you are responsible and your wife or your, your child or your mother or father has severe side effects. You are the one who I'm going to blame. And then I say, oh, oh, oh I will take care of my mother or father or something else. And this is where it's working nearly every patient. So you can't do it with everybody, but with remote, you can do that. And it works very, very fine because they always tell me, Christine, you told me I should uh, measure, uh, I should uh, mention it, and I'm doing it now because you requested for it. I say yes, great, thank you so much. Yeah. I find it so interesting. I, I always thought it was an Asian thing about being reticent about your um, what you're feeling or um, what you're experiencing, but it seems like it's a common experience for everybody, and you have to give patient permission to put to share, share what you're feeling. Yeah, but I think patient information is very, very difficult to write. Um, I have written a patient information about how to take care of the skin during target therapy for cancer. And I was working more than two years on this brochure. And there was uh, uh, information in it that you shouldn't uh, shower with hot water. And I had a woman who said after one and a half years, when can I start showering with, with cold water again? Because I did it my, my entire life. And I said, you, you could already, uh, while starting, it's only not allowed, or it's not allowed, I'm not saying allowed, but it's not wise to, uh, uh, to shower hot. But they misunderstood it. And I, did, I worked more than two years on this brochure to, to write it as clear as possible. But even so, it's very difficult when people think the uh, other way, they misunderstand what I'm trying to say. So patient information, I have learned, I've written so much information and I'm at a, at a board as well, I had the, the board for the studies, I don't know the English name for it, um, who tell if the studies are well performed, um, I can't remember the name for it, but um, I've written so many patient information and seen it and reviewed, reviewed it, but it's very difficult to be very short and very uh, clear. And that's the reason why I have the E in it about education. So show me what you have done, because then I can see if you understood it the way I wanted you to understand it. Because maybe the way I'm talking is not uh, working with the patient in front of me. Yeah. So I think um, really coming from this lack of change, um, the representative really needs to make sure that there's some kind of feedback coming from the patient to make sure that we're understanding their needs correctly and that they can respond or they can modify whatever else we can do. So, so unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Uh, I see you guys by the team. So thank you once again for uh, joining us for this session. I think I can get the second of the team and our very active Dr. Edward and Dr. Chantan and also the audience for um, joining us this afternoon. afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Christine. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Lim. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Bye.
Thank you so much to all of our attendees. We are happy to see you here today. Please don't forget to share your SEA BCS 2022 experience on social media and use these hashtags. Hashtag better future for breast cancer. Hashtag SEA BCS 2022. Hashtag SEA BCS Philippines. And hashtag SEA BCS Manila. We would like to thank our organizational partners. Global Focus on Cancer. American Society of Clinical Oncology. Philippine College of Surgeons. UICC Global Cancer Control. ABC Global Alliance. Philippine Society of Breast Surgeons. Philippine Society of Medical Oncology. Philippine Society of Oncologists. Suandok Breast Cancer Network. Cancer Coalition Philippines. Yayasan Kanker Payudara Indonesia. Shwe Yang Nin Si Cancer Foundation. And Reach to Recovery International. We would also like to extend our deepest appreciation to the following sponsors. Pfizer. Roche. AIA Philippines, Novartis, The Guzman Group, NutriAsia, Unilab, In the Pink, Healthway, and Globe.
sometimes feels like uh, a price is being put on our life and that isn't right. They just look at you as a walking corpse. You know, I am living the, probably their worst nightmare. It is treated like a curse.
they can't understand that there's no no happy ending, no uh, no getting better. No, let's not use the money for treatment because she's gonna die anyway. Thinking about my kids is difficult. I am advanced risk cancer. Welcome to the next session. We have Ms. Cara Magsanok Alipala as our moderator. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. I will be your moderator for this session, Advanced Breast Cancer, Courage and Composer, Composure in the Midst of Uncertainty. Once you're told you have advanced breast cancer or your cancer spread to other parts of your body, you feel many things at the same time. You're shocked, you're stunned, you're depressed, you're angry, maybe even guilty for not taking care of your health. Many things, it's very overwhelming. But you need to find your center and you will. We'll learn more about this later from a breast cancer patient with advanced breast cancer. We will also talk to a psychologist who is part of the ABC Alliance or the Advanced Breast Cancer Alliance, of which I can serve as a proud member. The video you saw earlier was produced by the ABC Alliance, a multi-stakeholder platform for organizations committed to develop, promote, and support awareness and actions that will improve and extend the lives of patients living with advanced breast cancer worldwide. They're also fighting for a cure to breast cancer. You can join the conversation by putting your comments or questions on the chat box. Feel free to tag us on your post. Our hashtags are hashtag CBAX2022, CBCS Philippines, and CBCS Manila, and CBCS PH. Now let's hear more from our friend at ABC Alliance. Her name is Lucia Travado, live from Barcelona. Over to you, Lucia. Hello everyone, I am Lucia Travado. I'm a clinical psychologist specialized in psycho-oncology and I work at the Champalino Clinical Center in Lisbon, Portugal. And I also am president emeritus of the International Psycho-Oncology Society and have recently had the pleasure of receiving the Jimmy Holland Memorial Award. Um, IPOS is collaborating with the ABC Global Alliance and I, it is my big pleasure to be here with you under this collaboration to discuss the psychological impact of ABC disease in patients and their partners. So thank you for having me. So I will be discussing a little bit um, some of the reactions of living emotional reactions and what can psychologists do to help you along this journey of living with a chronic disease. So there are many challenges about living with a chronic incurable disease which may um, reduce your survival time. There are frequent medical procedures uh, with chronic side effects that impact on your um, occupational uh, life or with some symptoms such as pain, fatigue, cognitive impairment, uh, sexual dysfunction, practical concerns at uh, the level of your professional life at the family uh, roles and also financial strains due to the uh, treatments. Um, and people who endure um, metastatic breast cancer are also at risk for emotional distress, which includes symptoms of depression and anxiety, as well as existential distress and loneliness. This stress peaks around the time of diagnosis and then declines in the year 
but it also tends to peak at each time the disease progresses. And almost one third of women with metastatic breast cancer meets the criteria for a depressive disorder and six meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder. So this is not um, a small thing. It really impacts a lot uh, women who have uh, this disease, this phase of the disease. Usually they describe it as living in uh, an emotional roller coaster. So during the day they can have all sorts of emotions, being happy, being depressed, being more optimistic, being more pessimistic. And the people who live with them, being the partners, the, the family, the caregivers, need to adjust to that and see it as normal because having to do a treatment every day and living with this uncertainty uh, of what um, life is going to bring you and what to expect is quite difficult. Although this tends to um, come with treatment, uh, have a certain regularity and things tend to achieve some kind of control which you will learn to have. So patients tend to describe, patients who have been diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer tend to describe it as very scary, very confused, feeling depressed, angry, and alone. And the main concerns have been described as fears of drying, dying from this disease, quality of life concerns because of the possible side effects of the treatment they have to endure and do for the rest of their life, concerns for the ability to care for their own family and um, end of life care if they would have good palliative care and if they will not suffer. The most frequent symptoms and side effects from metastatic breast cancer and its treatment are fatigue, insomnia, pain, hot flashes, cognitive problems, hair loss, sexual problems, depression, anxiety, neuropathy, loss of appetite and nausea, and many others. These are the most frequent. So this is a big deal for the person to be feeling every day. This is a big burden. And a good friend of mine who has been enduring metastatic breast cancer for nine years now and has suffered many progressions and many treatments. She describes it, she describes it as suffering from a chronic and incurable illness. We aren't able to get back to our formal life. We need permanent therapy. We have to come to terms with side effects and pain. We are exposed to a great psychological burden and need psychological support if possible. We aren't usually able to work full time anymore. We have to deal with persistent financial losses. We are forced to give up and restrain our life dreams. We bring challenges to our families and to our personal surroundings. And we are suddenly faced with end of life. So the diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer and its progressions bring a crisis to the person that she needs to adjust uh, so as to then cope better uh, on the emotional side and make, make it um, part of their life and their usual life. So on the first on the first part, they will need to make sense of what is happening to them. And they make a lot of questions. Um, then they are faced with many emotions. And then there are many coping tasks that they need to do as to adjust. So mainly maintain hope and directions, tolerate medical care, enhance their coping skills, maintain open communication with family, friends, and healthcare professionals, 
that's of utmost importance, open communications and bringing out what are your concerns, fears, doubts is most important to your doctors, but also to your um, partners and to your friends. It's important. Do not keep it inside. Bring it outside so that uh, you may receive help for it. Assess treatment and care options and choose your preferred ones, uh, mostly related with the type of side effects they will bring and maintain good relationships with your medical team. That's very important because they will be the ones that will accompany you throughout this journey. Your survival goals will be maintaining your dignity, your focus, your role in work, family, and in your community. And there are many professional interventions, psychological and not only, that will help you throughout the process and will help you in this coping and adjustment um, tasks that you need to do as to create a new balance and a new control in your life as to make it uh, regular. You need to um, really find a new balance in your life as to be able to live with, the, with it happily, if possible. So um, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network has coined this term distress as to define the type of emotional reactions that patients with a diagnosis of cancer or metastatic um, cancer um, feel because all patients diagnosed with cancer feel distressed. There is an impact, an enormous impact in the emotional side because cancer touches all dimensions of a person's life and it's normal that it creates uh, sadness, fears, and concerns which a patients have to adjust to. In early breast cancer, 32% of patients do have more severe forms of distress and advanced breast cancer, 60% of patients do not adjust so well and need um, professional support to adjust to these more severe forms of um, emotional reactions which go into this um, depression, anxiety, and maladjustment. There are many forms of accessing this um, distress. And this is the distress thermometer, which has been used in many, many countries and validated. And is just this one sheet and patients can complete it in less than five minutes in which they are asked, uh, please circle uh, the number that best describes how much distress you have been experiencing in the past week, including today. And uh, from zero to 10, they can describe the level of distress. And the professional, the healthcare professional knows from the level, if the patient is too distressed, they need to be referred to the um, mental health specialist, mostly a psycho-oncologist who can be um, a psychologist such as myself, but also it can be um, a psychiatrist or a specialized social worker or eventually a specialized a nurse specialist, uh, onco uh, specialist. Um, but the more severe forms really require a mental health expert. And here you also have a practical problem list with from practical problems, family problems, emotional and spiritual problems, and physical problems, which also include not only the regular ones, um, side effects of chemotherapy, but also others which can impact your um, life with your partner, such as sexuality um, and others, uh, which are important to be discussed with your healthcare team to be improved. 
But the good news is there are a number of psychological interventions specifically designed for metastatic breast cancer patients that help you reduce your emotional reactions from uh, reduce your depression, reduce your anxiety so that you can live better with the circumstance of having this metastatic breast cancer disease and uh, endure this journey in a more positive way. There are clinical practice guidelines that help um, psychologists and psycho-oncologists to deliver evidence-based um, care and interventions. There are many, as I mentioned, uh, types of therapy that can help you throughout the process. Some that have even shown benefits on survival uh, and benefits, of course, in reducing depression and death anxiety. It's important that couples also um, undergo uh, this type of support to get together because the communication is quite important between both of them so that this is not just uh, for the patient but for both of them because both of them are part of uh, this together and it's important that the partner also supports the patient and uh, feels that they are included and really indeed they are part of the team as the biggest support that the patient can have. So we psychologists will be very happy to have our, the, our patients, partners, caregivers, or family members closest to our patients to come to our consultations so as to hear their doubts, concerns as to best help both of you deal with this circumstance. Many years ago, the International Psycho-Oncology Society, which I'm, I mentioned that I am member and president emeritus, have put this uh, new standard of quality cancer care in which said that psychosocial cancer care should be recognized as a universal human right um, to patients and that quality cancer care must integrate the psychosocial domain into your routine cancer treatment and care, and that distress should be measured as the sixth vital sign after pain. And this was endorsed by the International Union Against Cancer in 2010, and more than 75 organizations worldwide have signed it. So nowadays, it is it should be part of your cancer treatment to have um, the opportunity to have psychological support in depth in your treatment. And I would like to finalize with a recent study that we have been published and disseminating, uh, which shows that indeed psychological support is not only improves your quality of life because it reduces your in negative emotions, but it also has an expression at the biobehavioral level um, and implications on your clinical outcomes. Uh, I had uh, the privilege of being the principal investigator of this Distress Brain Project, which was funded by our um, national governmental funds and had this um, incredible multidisciplinary team from um, diverse centers. Uh, and we have studied how much the um, negative emotions, which we know that um, metastatic breast cancer women experience a lot, how much uh, does it impact on the clinical outcomes and how much does it influence uh, immune dysregulation at the level of uh, the brain and also at the microenvironmental level? Because we know that depression may reduce survival and also we have evidence that psychological interventions such as cognitive behavioral stress management interventions for metastatic breast, uh, for breast cancer patients 
benefits patients' adaptation, including longer survival. We have not uh, tested it in metastatic breast cancer, but we want to, to do it so. And in this study in which we have uh, conducted it in our center and uh, 60 metastatic breast cancer patients were enrolled, the main results illustrated that negative associations between distress and metabolism activity in specific regions uh, were found so that uh, distress impacted on a reduced uh, metabolism in specific brain regions that were important for the adaptation to the stressful situations that our patients were enduring, that patients that perceived uh, that perceived as having less efficacy in stress management skills have greater levels of distress. So this means that if they learn how to adjust better, how to have better coping skills with their stressful situations, they would reduce their distress levels. Patients who have greater distress had uh, a flatter cortisol diurnal slope, which means that uh, having a neuro in, uh, neuroendocrine dysregulation, and that also they have higher inflammation if they had um, lower levels of social and family support and well being. And this is illustrated in these um, tables. I'm not going to undergo into this. These blue um, areas here are the one that show a reduced uh, lower metabolism related with the distress higher levels. Uh, and these are important areas for adaptation. Here you see, for instance, that patients with cognitive coping had less reduce, less distress, which is important. So we can teach our patients to have higher relaxation skills and higher coping skills, which help them to reduce their distress level. Here we show that patients who have um, uh, higher distress levels have less, uh, have a flatter uh, cortisol slope. And here patients who have uh, lower levels of social and family well-being have higher inflammation. So this shows that um, it is important to screen uh, patients' levels of psychological distress um, and so that to best if identify patients who are at risk uh, for um, psychological suffering and who may best benefit from psychological interventions as to improve patients' adaptation to their condition and to possibly also improve their clinical outcomes. So uh, indeed, having psychological support embedded in your treatment in care, it does not only improve your quality of life, which um, solves or lifts up your emotions, but also impacts at the biobehavioral level, and which has an impact on your clinical outcomes. Um, and this is just a, a chart from my good friend that I told you that she has been living with metastatic breast cancer uh, for uh, nine years now. She's Claudia Popicek. She has uh, a blog and she explains how she deals with her disease. And she says that she has, and I have asked her um, uh, for publishing this, um, presenting this slide, because I have asked her, what do you do to keep such a positive attitude throughout your life? And she said, there is 10, my 10 ways for a life with cancer. So she said, put stars on your light chain of life. So go to holidays, concerts, do as much of a life as possible. Accept your will illness and live with it as a co-pilot. Let yourself fall into a social net consisting of family and friends. 
find yourself a competent and empathetic oncologist, get psychosocial help, look for a fulfilling task, work or hobby to do, concentrate on your personal needs and choose your own way, try to make out all the positive aspects in this negative situation, collect information on your illness as well as all therapy options, be active and live here and now as much as possible to enjoy your life the best as possible and as much as possible. So this was my contribution and let's hear um, Bengi speaking and then we will have a conversation all together. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Lizia, for framing the conversation today. With me today is Bangge Mabanta, um, a patient with breast, advanced breast cancer, a dear friend. She's a board member of the I Can Serve Foundation. She's also a professional singer who has traveled the world to perform. Um, she's an amazing human being um, and a very good patient uh, counselor. Whenever I see her with a patient, you know, she just has to give you the look and hold your hand and you're already healed. Let's hear more about her story. Over to you, Bangit. Thanks for being here. Beautiful introduction. How can I follow that one? <laughs> thank you, thank you, Cars. Well, maybe I should start with how, from, from the very beginning, I was first diagnosed uh, with breast cancer in 2005. That time, um, my, my, son, uh, my sons were eight and five then. So I was just thinking of uh, getting healed. I just that's the only thing that came into my mind. Um, I, I, I want to survive this one. I want to fight this one because my kids were too young then and I don't want them to be motherless at that age. Maybe, I don't know if uh, I, 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 I didn't have time to be depressed at the time, but you know, I, my mindset was, I'll, I'll beat you, cancer. I'll beat you, cancer. And I begged the Lord to, I just want to see them graduate um, grade school. That's my goal. That was my goal. And then, you know, fast forward 17 years after, before the pandemic, I felt a lump again on my right breast, my other breast. And I told my son, what to my son, Miguel, he's here. Um, I, I told Miguel, um, you know, if this is cancer, which I think it is, because, you know, thanks for the information of I Can Serve Foundation. You know the symptoms of um, of uh, cancer thing. Um, I don't want to get treatment anymore because God has been very good to me. Be um, I saw you graduate grade school, high school, college, and what more can I ask for? Um, but then again, things change. <laughs> and then I went to. I didn't want to go to the doctor then and maybe maybe denial or maybe because of the pandemic, I don't want to go to the hospital, but then a lot of prodding uh, made. I went to my breast surgeon and true enough, when, he's, when she saw my breast, she said, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. To what extent, I don't know. She, she made a core needle biopsy, um, asked me to PET scan, and then when I came back for the result of my PET scan, um, the devastating news came that uh, it, it, uh, it metastasized already to my bones, to my pel uterus, pelvis, um, my lymph node, my brain. I didn't know what to ask. I just said, how long will I live? <laughs> That was the only question. I, that was the only question I asked her. And then she said, you know what? Um, live your life the way you want it to be. Like, live it to the fullest and let the medical team handle your cancer. You cannot, uh, there are things that you cannot handle anymore. So we will do it. We will do it. Um, I asked her if there's a chance for me to be treated. And uh, she said, uh, we'll do the best we can. So the treatment that I finally decided to have it treated 
because of my family. Miguel, do you want to say something? Because my, my son said, you know, mom, I saw how you spoil your kids, I, I, your, your grandchildren from your nephews and nieces. Why don't you give your, our kids a chance to be spoiled by you? It's like um, fight, fight for your life. Maybe there's a chance, you don't know. Instead of just giving up. But I told him, I mean, I, then I have to deal, deal with, uh, with all the side effects again. It's like starting all over again, like 17 years ago. And she said, 17 years ago, we weren't old enough to support you. And now we're here. And thank you. <laughs> so that's how I decided to do six chemotherapy and um, did all my treatments. Yes. Miguel, yeah, tell us more about it. I think you're the big supporter and inspiration of your mother. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think it, it was much different from the first time because, the, like, like you said, the first time I was still too young to really understand what was really going on. But this time, I, what, what, the thing that I, could, that I could give you, you know, when we found out, because it was hard for us as well, finding out that, you know, that, but the thing that we could give you the most was our undying support, right? So as much as possible, we in the family like to be lighthearted. You know, we, we, we love joking around, we love playing around. So one of the things that I sort of, I, I told you, it, it was uh, lucky that my cousins just gave birth to, to kids then. So one of the things I told her was, you know, they're play with them, just play with them, you know, have, have fun with them and stuff like that. You know, who knows? Maybe you can learn to to enjoy life through that through that lens again. I think another difficulty that we had was, you know, it was the middle of the pandemic. So we didn't really know what to do. Fears were were coming in. And everything that we could do to make life fun, interesting, and just help my mom live as she wants to live. You know, that's what we gave to her as much as we could. But this is also something we should do for people who are not sick, don't you think? <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, I think so. I think yeah. that's, that's, good, um, that's a good outlook for someone who's going through something and even for people who are not going through anything. You know, it's, it's having a better outlook in life, I would, I think makes things, I wouldn't say easier, but sort of worth living. We're going through these, these hardships. So Marty, Marty is the husband of Bangge. Your son has composure and courage. What went through your mind when you found out that Bangge's cancer had spread? Well, it, it's not different from the first time she, was, she had them. The first one was, was, was devastating. The second one was not easier. Uh, obviously, the uh, the second one had had metastasized to, uh, to 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 the rest of her body, so it was it was uh, more uh, it it was it was scary, you know, for for all of us. But we, you know, we did have some practice prior to this. Uh, we used to to uh, uh, treat her like a princess. Now we treat her like a queen. You know, uh, we just we we just need to do that, and and it it's it's not something we had to do. It's something we wanted to do for her, because that's and it's it's it, it's helpful that we uh, we included friends and family to this journey, because uh, maybe it's also helpful that we are Filipinos and we're we're, we're close knit, so the friends. Especially the, the friends, they're, they're they're very, they're very uh, supportive. In fact, it's it's funny that uh, the first time she had her her uh, her her chemo, she was she was having uh, she shaved her head, and the rest of my friends did the same thing. They did. I didn't. I, I like I like my hair. <laughs> so so they were very supportive. So that was that was good. Well, you have faith. You have friends. You have family. Um, you have everything. You have a sense of humor. 
that helps us keep going. But you, Marty, where do you get your support? Are there times you need to talk to someone? I mean, that you can't, things you can't tell Bunge. Who do you turn to? Who's your support? Well, you know, uh, my brother-in-law, the, 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 the husband of my, my sister, had cancer. And we, we were asking ourselves, or we were telling ourselves that you guys are lucky because you have your support group in I Can Serve. We don't. <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, we, were, we are trying to go through the same journey as you, you, you guys do, but we don't have the same support. But we do get our strength from seeing our partners bang getting better. And, you know, it, it does help that our friends are very positive about the whole thing, always. I want to bring in Lucia into the discussion. Lucia. Hi, Lucia. From Barcelona. I am in Barcelona. Yeah, thank you and, for joining uh, us. Good afternoon, everyone there. Hi. I'm happy to join. Hi, Bangi. Hi, Hello. Marty. Good to Hi. see you again. <laughs> Nice to see the whole family. I'm uh, happy to also get to know the son of both of you very well. I think that's very nice to bring the full support. And that's uh, quite important because all of you are uh, Bangi's support and the support of each other. So uh, thank you for that. Tara, tell me. Yeah. <laughs> Lucia, in, in, in Southeast Asia, not everybody can afford professional psychological help, especially those with extreme depression. How do you suggest they cope if they can't afford professional services? Well, I know that uh, patient uh, organizations like, like the Reach to Recovery, for instance, and this can be a good way to find support, um, such as peer support. And I know that some of the patients have had education on how to um, give, uh, uh, let's say more, um, not professional, but uh, adequate psychological support so as to lift up uh, the morale of uh, the patients that have undergone, um, uh, that are undergoing this situation by people that have already coped with these problems. And uh, at least it, um, it uh, helps not to be isolated. One of the big problems of being depressed is being isolated uh, because the person thinks that um, the problems are only of them and that they feel awkward and different and if they share the problems that they are having and see that the other women that are undergoing the same problems, uh, the same situation as far as the disease, have the same types of problems uh, and they share the ways of coping this can be very helpful and they not feel so isolated and um, they can even be cheerful uh, in the ways of coping as I don't remember the son of uh, Bangi. What's his, what's your name? Miguel. Uh, Miguel. Oh, Miguel. It's like a Portuguese uh, name. So the joy, it's quite important to um, uh, bring the joy to life. And uh, in, uh, in the beginning, as you all mentioned, there is this uh, bang in the stomach of the diagnosis. As Bangi said, I don't want to do more treatment. Um, there's nothing to do. But then you have to react and see the opportunities. Let's try, let's see what I can do. And let's see how it goes. Let it roll. As, as, it, as it say. And then um, you are there, Bangi, and you are functioning so well. So that's so hopeful that other women see that. And you have a strong support from your family. And that's so much important. And that's the way it should be, not to um, give up, 
but uh, go on and give life an opportunity because life is very strong and keep together as i'm as you were saying if there are no professionals around so go to your patients associations try to ask from your friends do you know anyone who has gone through breast cancer and uh, try to connect with them and they probably know other resources uh, so that's the best way Thanks, Lizia. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Bungay, I just want to ask you, at what point did you feel, I got this, I'm in control, and you were able to keep yourself calm? When did that happen for you? Mm, not yet. <laughs> no, but uh, I think uh, when I started my, my, my doctor's uh, appointment, and he said that, okay, this is our plan. This is our plan. We'll will control the brain first the brain to more and the rest when i had a clearer plan then i told myself maybe i'm i'll be i'll just follow i'll just follow it and even my son said um let the doctors do it let not cancer take over your life you have a life to live cancer is not part of your plan so let's put not put aside, but you know, do not dwell on it. It's just that, like what you said, Lucy, I'm just so lucky to have a very supportive family. <laughs> my husband is very supportive, and uh, my kids also. I thought uh, motherhood ends there. Uh, I thought when motherhood is just like when they were young, but uh, now I appreciate more like dealing with cancer, they're grown up already. And more or less, I know more my path through them, through the help of my kids also. Uh, there's a, a message from the chat box. You are not alone, Bangge. Good, your family looks at your situation in a very positive way. Yeah, she has a very good team. <laughs> Thank you. To Thank the you. Team Mabanta for taking care of Bangge. Thank you. So Bangge, what message do you have for people going through the same thing with you? As you are, uh, um, I, I saw that that the bottle. I think it's a very hope is a very powerful word. Sometimes we take it for granted, but you know, hope. If you do, if you do, if you lose hope, no best doctors, no best medicines will will work for you. Just keep on hoping. I think it's it's uh, so 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 powerful to keep on hoping. Yeah, and I think in Southeast Asia, everybody is very spiritual somehow, and that has helped ground and strengthen everybody's resolve, right? True. Mm -hmm. Um, I know we don't have much time, but I just want to ask Bangge this. She's a very good singer, Luzia. I don't know if you know this. I'm gonna ask her to sing a few songs that calm you when you're feeling stressed, or a song you want to inspire others with. Go ahead. It's not wholesome. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> um, there's this my favorite song. I, I want to share it with you also, Lucia. Um, you. You've got to give a little, take a little, and let your poor heart break a little. That's the glory of, that's the story of love. You've got to cry a little, laugh a little. And let the sun go by a little. That's the story of, that's the glory of love. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> mm, isn't it? Life is not all good. I mean, you have, that's like the song goes, you have to cry a little to appreciate laughter. You have to win to appreciate, uh, you have to lose to appreciate winning. That's 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 life. Let let me just uh, say something that I, I I mentioned when we were discussing in the background, the power of having a good husband by your side, and a good a good and good children, of course. <laughs> uh, but it's so powerful to have good husband by your side, and I want to reinforce this. And I want um, Martin, is that the name? Um, no, yes. 
to really bring up uh, how important it was to be by the side of Bangi. It was not easy, uh, but he has such an important role. As I say, you are the most important emotional um, balance to our patients. And as a psychologist, I value uh, completely your role by our patients. And you are my co-therapist, so please, men out there, partners, do your role because your women need you and they need your love and that's the best besides hope love is the word that uh, our patients our women need in this situation right amen. marty and Miguel? <laughs> amen to that lucia yes agree on that note i think whether you have early breast cancer or even advanced breast cancer it's really not about that I mean, it's really about all of us will be going through stress and anxiety, but cancer patients, cancer survivors like Bange or even myself, the moment you're diagnosed, you just kind of get it right away. You have no choice. You have to figure out life. You have to figure out your purpose, your meaning, and you just have to pursue it with a tunnel vision because you know it can be over in a second. So these are things you can learn from people like us. We feel privileged in a way that we get to get it earlier on than others. Um, some people find out after a really mega crisis or after their deathbed when it might be a little too late for the people around them. So we, we want to thank you, Bange, Marty, and Miguel. Please keep up the good work you're doing. You're an inspiration to all of us. Bange, you will live a long, long, long life, I assure you. I, you have, with your attitude, you're a winner. You're a winner, thank you, I'm serious. sure. Thank you, Kara. <laughs> and don't forget, you have all of us here at the I Can Serve Foundation and everybody watching here. And I know you did this for people going through the same thing. It's not easy to be here. Thank you to your family. Thank you for sharing. And thank to you all too. the people who support Bangay, my goodness, um, amazing. I heard you form prayer groups. You pray every day for her. You do it together. Um, no one can do this alone. Please try to form a team the way Bangay has or the way her family has. Get good doctors you trust because they will do the job that you really can't do. And once they're doing that, you're in control. That helps a lot. So I hope you don't leave this um, session unchanged. Be kind, be patient, and be very thoughtful and be nice to all the cancer survivors. Hear their stories. And if you're one, share your story. It can save another person's life. Thank you for joining us again. See you in the other sessions. Thank you so much to all of our attendees. We are happy to see you here today. Please don't forget to share your SEA BCS 2022 experience on social media and use these hashtags. Hashtag better future for breast cancer. Hashtag SEA BCS 2022. Hashtag SEA BCS Philippines. And hashtag SEA BCS Manila. We would like to thank our organizational partners. Global Focus on Cancer, American Society of Clinical Oncology, Philippine College of Surgeons, UICC Global Cancer Control, ABC Global Alliance, Philippine Society of Breast Surgeons, Philippine Society of Medical Oncology, 
Philippine Society of Oncologists, Suwandok Breast Cancer Network, Cancer Coalition Philippines, Yayasan Kanker Payudara Indonesia, Shui Yang Nin Si Cancer Foundation, and Reach to Recovery International. We would also like to extend our deepest appreciation to the following sponsors. Pfizer, Roche, AIA Philippines, Novartis, the Guzman Group, Nutriasia, Unilab, In the Pink, Healthway, and Globe. To those who know them, he is one of two miracles. Um, that's a backstory. He's also a founder and creator of the In the Pink app, and he's really into democratizing access through digitization of crucial cancer information. Beside Nick is Minnie Panghilinan, another rock star, designer and co-creator of UPC Book, a group that creates medical devices and innovation. And joining us from all corners of the globe, we have fellow rock stars. Um, we have Sam Daswani, a self-described patient from hell, who is in fact an angel to the breast cancer community with Manta Cares, which he'll tell us about later. And we have Sam Jackman, co-founder of Boost Innovation, an artist and inventor. Sam saw the issues her mother was having with breast forms and prosthesis, and so she decided to just solve it by inventing Boost, and she's here to tell us all about that later. Um, I'm honored to introduce Chris Anseldran. Good afternoon again. Are we good with the slides? Okay, before the slides, good afternoon. A uh, little bit of a history. When Kara, two other breast cancer survivors, and I started the foundation 23 years ago, we had just been diagnosed. We didn't initially have any grand plans, and we knew very little. 
What we knew for certain was what we did not want the next person diagnosed to be in the dark when it came to information or in the dark because of fear. Slides. Next slide, please. Okay. Like many foundations, we began organically. We met with other survivors, other patient groups. We fundraised creating cards. We staged fashion and food fairs. We fundraised at local malls. We published a resource book. At one point in time, we even built a sensory garden for a hospital for women in treatment. We used what we had, sometimes very little, and used these in the ways we knew how. Next slide, please. Witnessing firsthand the state of breast cancer here in the country and the limited resources made available, it slowly became clear our loudest mission would be advocating for early breast cancer detection. Apart from the strategic partnerships with local governments to hold community-based early detection programs all year round in key cities made possible through a local ordinance, the month of October, Okay-tober to us here at I Can Serve meant conducting forums and screening sessions in partnership with offices, medical societies, patient groups, hospitals, and barangays. It was here when we spoke on the importance of taking charge of our own health, on following the guidelines that included mammograms, cl clinical exams, and checkups, particularly having regular breast self-exams. In mid-2020, when it became apparent we would not be able to hold our in-person early detection initiatives, we found ourselves in uncharted territories. We found ourselves back to where we started. The pandemic kept us in the dark, but we were adamant women didn't need to be. It was evident that breast cancer screening rates dropped dramatically during the pandemic. Many healthcare facilities delayed elective procedures. To reduce the risk of further infecting others and to address safety practices, majority of the hospitals and clinics canceled mammograms, ultrasound, even clinical exams. How could we arm women with vital life-saving information that would be simple, accurate, and concise? That would be easy to transport, that they could keep as a reminder, and that we could produce in spite of the nationwide shutdowns. Next slide, please. And so we created Kamay Gabay. Next slide, please. Kamay means hand. Gabay is guide or support. The Kamay Gabay kit is a resource guide. It is an educational kit. Next slide, please. What is in the kit? Breast cancer 101 information and illustrations. Next slide. Myths and facts. We have had many women come to us and tell us they believe their cancer began because a toddler kicked them when they were younger or because they fell on their chest. We thought it best to discuss common misconceptions or set things straight. We wanted to provide the facts. We also have risk factors. There are those who have no control over in that there are those we can influence and change. What are the symptoms to be mindful for, to look out for? What are the recommended guidelines by age? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, one slide back. Thank you. One more slide back, please. Okay, that's fine. No worries. Okay. An illustrated guide how to properly perform a breast self-exam. We hope to reach as many women as possible. The kit was made in three languages, English, Cebuano, and Tagalog. Next slide, please. It is also an accessory. It is a bag charm with beads that demonstrate the average size of lumps typically found in women. Those who undergo annual checkups by health practitioners, those who conduct monthly self-exams, those who conduct these infrequently, and those who do not check at all and usually find it by accident. Next slide, please. Through the generosity of private corporations, municipalities, government organizations, and individuals who together with us saw the importance of information and cancer awareness, the Gabay Kamay Gabay Kit made its way into the hands of women. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Between the months of October and November 2020 alone, and in the middle of one of the country's most stringent lockdowns, 2,740 kits were made and distributed. Next slide. Last slide, please. Thank you. It is our hope that this will be a constant and visual reminder to be proactive about our own health. 
it is also a reminder for each of us that no matter how small or grand, we can overcome the challenges of change. As they say, great opportunities often come disguised as impossible situations. Thank you. Thank you, Sad. Thank you, Sad. We now have Mikael Seldran following that. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. My name is Mikael Sajan, and I'm a senior attending the International School of Manila. I wanted to take this time to thank the Iconserve Foundation for giving me the opportunity to discuss about my app and initiative in the pink and how it came to be. Next slide, please. Firstly, why did I create in the pink? My mother is a breast cancer survivor. My mother is a breast cancer survivor. She was diagnosed in 1999, or six years before I was born. As a child of a cancer survivor, it was impossible not to know about breast cancer even at an early age. Pink shirts and bracelets filled the cabinets and closets. There were survivors always meeting at her house. I once modeled a shirt with the words that reads, tough kids wear pink, as you can see here, alongside my twin brother. My usual job black soccer laces were replaced with pink ones in October, as my teammates and I would lace up for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. There were football tournaments, food fairs, and there were many, many breast cancer awareness events that we attended as, as a family. Even though cancer entered my home well before I was born, I learned firsthand, as I'm sure it is the same for many of you, that cancer doesn't just affect the patient, it affects everyone. During the pandemic, I saw how my mom and other breast cancer survivors, my aunt's I Can Serve Foundation, created printed resource kits and charms to be delivered to women's homes as they were unable to hold early detection activities in person. During this time, clinics were closed and people were afraid to step out of their homes. I realized how it was even scarier and more difficult and more complicated for these, for these people. During this time, I also developed a special interest in computer science. Here in the Philippines, where kids like us weren't allowed to leave our homes, I took extra classes on some evenings to learn how to code. I knew then I wanted to create an app that was both are created for both children and adults, free, easy to, easy to navigate, and one that provided the information that anyone could have access to. And that is how In The Pink came to be. Next slide, please. So what is In The Pink? In The Pink is a free mobile application for Android, providing information, resources, and support for the Philippine breast cancer community. It is available for download on the Google Play Store as you can see here are the instructions, and here is the, the download link. And for those who, are not, who do not have Android devices or are not Android users, it is also a responsive website, inthepinkph.com, accessible to anyone with a gadget, any smartphone, any laptop, any iPad, any desktop, etc. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So what does In The Pink consist of? In the whole page of In The Pink, you will find four sections about breast cancer, early detection guidelines, resource directory, and within The Pink. There are also two additional sections where you can learn more about the I Can Serve Foundation and about In The Pink Philippines. Next slide, please. Firstly, In The Pink contains a resource guide on all things breast cancer. In partnership with Iconser Foundation, it is a digital kit with pertinent information such as what is breast cancer, who is at risk, what are the risk factors, what are the myths and truths, what are the signs, what is a self-breast examination and how should one perform it. All this information available in three languages, English, Tagalog, and Bisaya, or Cebuano. And if one isn't exactly sure on how to conduct a breast self-examination, there is an animated video produced by I Can Serve and Novartis that can guide and walk you through it every step of the way. Next slide, please. Next, you'll also find a directory of healthcare facilities and hospitals that one can visit in Metro Manila, Cebu, and Davao, together with an itemized list of these services and a price breakdown of these services. For example, if you are living in the gig city and in need of a chest x-ray, 
or living in Davos City and in need of a head CT scan, you will be able to access the available resources in the locations nearest to you. For those diagnosed, there's a list of support and patient groups that you can join in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Thank you so much to all the groups that have agreed to be a part of In The Pink. We hope to expand these lists into other locations in the upcoming weeks and months. Next slide, please. Another feature is a notification function, an alarm that notifies users when it's time for them to perform their next breast self-examination. No more excuses about forgetfulness. Lastly, a recent addition to In The Pink is Within The Pink, a resource corner for children of breast cancer survivors. There are recommended books, poems and artworks, articles and videos where children of breast cancer survivors can learn more about what their mothers were going through, as well as the experiences of other children who were touched by cancer. Through this application, I want survivors and their families to know that they are not alone. Because in a country with the highest prevalence of breast cancer in Asia, and the seventh highest prevalence in the world, they may feel unrepresented. I want the next person who types mom and breast cancer in a single search, like I did, to see a world of resources available. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mick. I introduce to you Minnie Pangilina. One of the greatest motivation for uh, choosing the breast dorm is the fact that the Philippines is one of the places with the highest prevalence of breast cancer. BRACOM is a lightweight internal breast prosthesis for post mastectomy patients. So here we can see the design of the BRACOM itself is inspired by nature. So we use generative design to create this pattern, coral-like or seashell-like pattern that retains the form of the Braco while consuming less material. So with this, it costs us less and it weighs less. We can 3D scan a patient or create a 3D model out of their other imaging techniques like CT scan or MRIs. From there, we can create the surface of the Braco and then create a pattern. And then that pattern we can now 3D print with our Placo. Bracom is made of placom, this material. It's a biocomposite made out of all biodegradable materials, all organic. It's composed of bacon pellets here and a polylactic acid. The bacon plant is an aquatic plant. They just grow randomly in rivers, riverbeds. Most of the members of the community consider them as pests. 3D printing or additive manufacturing makes us really adaptable and we can make highly customized forms. So we can make each BRACOM unique to its user, to, to their bodies. BRACOM, if thrown away, naturally biodegrades under composting conditions. That way, they don't harm the environment. Also, if you want a refitting, you can give us your BRACOM, old BRACOM, and then we'll melt it since it's made out of polylactic acid. And then we'll reprint it and adjust it to your body. The prestige of the James Dyson Award itself opens up a lot of opportunities for potential partners in the future. Today called Brafong. Uh, can we go to the slide? There. So, um, So, I'm Mini Pangilinan. I'm an industrial designer. I have uh, degrees in industrial design and computer science. And uh, my co-inventor is Jason Pichardo. His specialty, he can't be here with me today, um, but his specialty is in material science and engineering. We are both from the University of the Philippines, Diliman. And currently, we are working with the UP Seaball, which is a group in PGH. It's, it's an interdisciplinary group that creates uh, medical innovations and devices. So Jason and I uh, are the 
inventor slash designers of uh, Bracong. So Bracong is a lightweight external breast prosthesis for uh, breast cancer survivors that uh, empowers our breast cancer survivors who are experiencing um, an altered sense of self-esteem and body image. So why did we find a need for this? Um, it's because we found this alarming uh, statistics. Um, this is from the early 2010s statement by the Philippine Society of Medical Oncology. And it states that the Philippines is among the highest uh, countries with the highest prevalence of breast cancer and the top in, in the world. So listening to some of the latest data uh, from yesterday, I think this is changed. But uh, still, the alarming fact remains that a lot of Filipinas get the disease. In fact, a lot of, a lot of women all over the world get uh, the disease. So uh, this was really our motivation in uh, doing the project. So um, when, uh, when patients undergo mastectomy, some, after the procedure, may experience this altered sense of self-esteem that may lead to introversion um, insecurity and inhibition, and it can adversely affect a woman's feelings of femininity and self-confidence. So among the survivors that we've talked to, they express that they felt um, half as a woman or abnormal or um, even depressed. So um, one option is to go for a reconstruction, another invasive procedure, this can be risky, expensive, and exhausting. So as an alternative, um, our breast cancer survivors can opt to get a uh, breast form. So breast forms are products that imitate the breast shape um, to provide the desired look of normalcy. Um, but we also looked at the sustainability issues of prosthesis in general. So because of their highly um, personalized nature, they don't have a secondary market. So when, when it's used and upon wear and tear, or if the body of the patient changes, the prosthetic is no longer usable. So they may end up in our closets, gathering dust, or um, worse, uh, they could end up uh, piling up in landfills. So with these, uh, to address these and with circularity in mind, um, we made Bracong. So Bracong is the, this lightweight external breast prosthesis made from the Bacong plant. So we uh, start from the Bacong plant and then we make this uh, Placong. We call the material Placong because it's a combination of the Bacong plant and the common 3D printing material called PLA. And then after that, we create the Bracong, which is Bra plus Bacong. So a little more about the plant. So Bacong is actually found in several countries in Southeast Asia. But in um, Cagayan, in the northern part of the Philippines, um, it's uh, found there to be an obstruction in lakes and rivers. So um, one of the projects of... Uh, the Design Center of the Philippines is their Smart Materials Project, where they where they find um, and collaborate with innovators and designers like us to find potential uses of this plant. So Bacong is unutilized by the farmers, and uh, Jason and I uh, we wanted to tell this story how uh, we can turn something useless into something useful. And uh, that's why we uh, responded to the call of uh, the Design Center of the Philippines. Also, some local...
your stomach without causing upset. And you can also find out some strategies in order to calm your body. For example, do the meditations or the relaxation exercise, etc., in order to help the coping with feeling of loss and subjective nausea. Next slide, please. Now, it is very, very important in order to do your best uh, to maintain the nutrition diet during and after the cancer treatment. Now, do whatever you can uh, for food and the fruit intake. And for example, you can create an environment to stimulate your appetite. And, and you can also eat the small meal frequently throughout uh, the day and also take some slack or the drinking fruit in between. And you can also establish a, a pattern of eating meals and snacks at the same time of the day. And please follow the, uh, your desire of what you want to eat, which is really important. So just in, uh, for example, if uh, the clock say that it is time for dinner and you are craving the breakfast, go with your desires. Okay, next slide, please. And other suggestions like you can keep the snack handy because people usually tend to eat more when the food is readily available. And at the times when your appetite is low, you need to try some brand food. However, if you have some appetite, so try some eat some favorite food, no matter the time of the day. And if you cannot eat enough food to maintain your weight, try high calorie, high protein drink as prescribed by your daughter. So next slide, please. Okay, now uh, apart from the chemotherapy, so radiation therapy is another major treatment for the breast cancer. Now, however, <laughs> My mission is to make patients' voices stronger globally and more present in the health political agenda. Thank you very much. And I hope I didn't I do badly about timing, Anna. Thank you, Myra. Yes, you did a little bit. Uh, use more time, but it was fantastic presentation. It really, I think it's very, it's very, very inspiring. So I have a question for you. You work uh, under FEMAMA in Brazil, which is a partnership or a, an umbrella organization of many other organizations. How can you translate all the learnings and best practices of all the work you've done into the global space? There is such a need to be able to do initiatives like you do in Brazil, in other places of the world. So tell us a little bit, um, how can you go from being just national or in Brazil to really expand that impact globally. We need, uh, Anna, to find common agenda. We need to, to, to collaborate more because I'm sure in Southeast Asia, and now that we have these opportunities virtually, we can interact more often. And I hope you can do more of this, Anna. Uh, because you've been fantastic when you've been putting us together to think. But I think collaboration is uh, the word to say here. 
And when we started to work together, seven, now we are 75 NGOs in Brazil working together. We come together every year and we are going to fight for three priorities. We have a whole agenda, but we have to put our minds in few priorities and work very intensely until we get it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, uh, Myra, for you know presenting today. I really hope that your you know your ideas can be really uh, translated globally and really help people, not just in Brazil or Southeast Asia, but all over the world. Thank you. Excellent uh, presentation by Myra, a true advocate at heart. I mean, we can, there's no question about that. Um, she has also, I really like the vision, this vision that this global perspective of collaboration and, and participation around the globe. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Ceci Nita Wuntu. She is a teaching staff at Faculty of Languages and Arts at Manado State University, North Sulawesi. She was diagnosed in breast cancer with breast cancer in 2018 and joined the patient organization, Indonesian Cancer, cancer Information and Support Center, uh, also known as CISC, in the same year. She was treated with trastuzumab and she then created the Breast Cancer HER2 Positive Community Group at CISC. She will be speaking about their efforts to include treatment anti her to in the public health reimbursement system. She is going to speak from Indonesia, but she's going to speak live. Thank you. So, Sassy, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, dear moderator. And ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Well, I'm Cecinita Wundu from Indonesia. Uh, I am now in Manado, uh, the northern part of, of Sulawesi. Uh, I, I am uh, really close to you uh, in Philippines and affiliated in Cancer Information Support Center Association Indonesia. I am a four and a half year survivor, breast cancer of the subtype HER2 positive. It has been also uh, introduced and it is easily understood of why it is I who present this topic. So well, I am so grateful and honored to be among of you represented all elements connected to cancer in Southeast Asia. I'm really glad to be here for sharing CISC experiences ideas and advocacy. This is really grateful for us all. So thank you also to I Can, See, I Can Serve Foundation Inns and the committee that have invited us to take part in this uh, great symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, while dealing with personalized medicine, I will be talking about patient voices, targeted therapy for breast cancer subtype for subtype HER2 positive in Indonesia and it will be presented from the perspective of Cancer Information Support Center Association, CISC Indonesia. Hence, this presentation will first, firstly talk in brief about the organization. So our organization, uh, so our organization is Indonesian Cancer Information Support Center Association with the vision Indonesia Care for Cancer. And it was established in 2003 and 70% of its members are cancer survivors from all types of cancer. So the activities of this uh, association as a support group 
and also providing information and education publicly and particularly to the patients. And we are having also program lay patient navigation at the hospital. And we also empower members by training those who can train others, especially to educate others and providing information as training of trainer, trainer of speaker. And we have also uh, yoga and dance class classes, etc. So we also provide patient lodging for those who belong to National Social Security Agency of Health. And also we are doing advocacy to help patients access the, the expensive medicine. Uh, so from the data of Global, Global Can in 2020, the amount of new cases, breast cancer cases is 16.6% from the new cases, grand total of cancer, and it is almost uh, 400,000. Uh, Breast cancer impacts patients physically and psychologically. This is the main issue that seemingly have been understood by us all. But the specific things that are noted here are 90% of breast cancer patients in Indonesia are in productive age. So the range is 25 up to 55 years. And many of them still have children living at home and they have to work and have family responsibility and, and et cetera more likely to experience specific comorbidities, including fatigue. The psychological issue associated with breast cancer, including anxiety, loneliness, depression, anger, guilt, fear of recurrence, and body image changes. The greater life stage challenges felt by younger women with breast cancer in adapting to the unexpectedness of breast cancer diagnosis, including possible losses in their career, family life, and fertility. HER2 positive early breast cancer patients in Indonesia are not guaranteed and, and so neglected in the National Social Security Agency of Health. For that reason, the mortality in Indonesia, in this case, uh, dealing with uh, breast cancer, uh, is higher than in neighboring countries. Breast cancer is the leading cause, leading cause of cancer death, about 21.4% of Indonesian women. There are around 22,000 deaths, so it is about 17 per 100 women among those breast cancer patients. This is higher than other developing countries as Th Thailand, uh, only 10.5, and also Vietnam, uh, only also 10.5%. And breast cancer brings impact to patients, their family, and increasingly becomes burden to the society. They are, there are more and more breast cancer women losing years of healthy life. As we all know that diagnosing and treating HER2 positive breast cancer early before it has spread may provide the best chance of cure. When breast cancer is diagnosed and treated early, it is potentially curable by preventing the disease from returning or re reaching an advanced incurable states. About one in five breast cancer women diagnosed with HER2 positive. Those women will have faster disease progression and poorer chances of survival. Around 70% of breast cancer women in Indonesia are actually have the chance of cure because they are in early states. Uh, actually, state one, stage two, and state three. However, 
15% of those women early breast cancer patient die within its within one year. One year mortality rate in another countries are range from uh, zero to nine percent, where more than seventy percent of breast cancer women in those countries still alive in five years. HER2 positive early breast cancer is a governmental priority in other countries, including developing countries, with the availability of highly effective HER2 targeted therapy in their reimbursement coverage. The issues of breast cancer, HER2 positive, that are not guaranteed by the government through National Social Security Agency of Health seems to affect the effectiveness of treatment. This is shown by the data here in which the mortality rate of early breast cancer is the same as the mortality rate of metastatic, metastatic breast cancer. Mortality rate of early breast cancer patient in Indonesia is higher than other countries and similar with mortality rate in metastatic breast cancer patients, as a result that many of them are not treated uh, optimally. Concerning the issue of early breast cancer in Indonesia, CISC is there to do the advocacy and assisting the patient and the survivor of breast cancer HER2 positive. Currently, there are about 394,000 member, uh, 94 members sorry, of HER2 positive community in WhatsApp group that is made about four years ago. More importantly, CISC is now educating and improving literacy of patients and caregivers to understand the treatment journey. Example, by involving media engagement, webinar, seminar, forum group, group discussion, Facebook fan page, and WhatsApp group. CISC is also enabling patients to partner with doctor in making treatment decisions. Example, collaborating with the public partners to define treatment decisions. the previous slide. Yeah, first I would like to uh, highlight the 10 cancer prevention recommendation, which is uh, developed by the American Institute of Cancer Research, and it covers all types of cancer risk. And as we know that obesity is a common risk factor for chronic illnesses, including cancer. So the first recommendation is to keep a healthy body weight, which can be achieved by following a healthy diet and having an active lifestyle. Winnie has covered active lifestyle before, so I will focus more on the dietary factors. Indeed, there are five recommendations that is related to a healthy diet, including encouraging a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans, and limiting the consumption of several foods including the red meat and processed meat, sugar sweetened drinks, alcohol, as well as fast food and other processed food that are high in fat, starches, or sugars. And in among these 10 recommendations, there's one uh, for after a cancer diagnosis, and it is to follow the recommendation if you can. And they also recommend not to use supplements for cancer prevention. And as uh, research on cancer survivors are emerging and they uh, have developed specific guidelines for breast cancer survivors, which is shown on the 
speaker on the right. And uh, there's five recommendations, and most of it is similar to that uh, of the cancer prevention, including uh, keeping a healthy weight, uh, keeping an active lifestyle, and uh, eating a variety of foods that contains fiber, and limiting fatty acids, fried food, and processed foods with added fats. And there's a specific recommendation on the soil intake for breast cancer survivor. That is to uh, take a moderate amount of soil, which is around one to two servings a day. And this is considered safe for cancer survivors. Next slide, please. Okay. And there's a common cons consensus that there's no single food can protect you against cancer by itself. Indeed, cancer research has been uh, done for the latest uh, 40 years. And in the beginning, in 1980s, researchers has been looking and searching for some single nutrients, we call it magic bullet, that can help to prevent cancer. But however, as research evolved and uh, after 40 years, there's uh, strong evidence suggesting that dietary pattern is more important than looking at one single nutrient because uh, this is more similar to, similar to what people eat on a daily basis. And there's a consistent evidence on uh, recommending a plant-based diet with a variety of fruits, vegetables, beans, and whole grains for reducing cancer risk. Next slide, please. Okay, in the following slide, I will share some of the tips to eat healthy. The first one is to plan ahead. Don't wait until the last minute because people often choose what they like instead of what is good for them when they have to make a quick decision. So you can plan a day before or even better a week before. Careful planning can help you be more organized and ensure that you shop for the right ingredients, not the unhealthy one. So when planning, just think of some of the healthy recipes that you are using or sometimes you can choose one or two new recipes so that to make cooking more fun. And based on the planned uh, menu, you can create a list of shopping lists. And um, it is also important to check your stocks. Having a old, an orderly arranged fridge and pantry can help you plan and so that you won't overbuy some of the ingredients. And while shopping, uh, just stick to your list and don't look at the uh, unhealthy options. And this can help you uh, resist the temptation to buy unhealthy food. And the last recommendation is to always read the food labels. In general, most prepackaged food are printed with food labels. Uh, you can use food labels to compare two different kinds of products and always check the fat uh, sugar and salt content. Sometimes the salt content is displayed as sodium, which is equivalent. And um, when you are comparing, just be careful that uh, the nutrient information displayed may be uh, is for different serving size. So when you make a reasonable comparison, you have also checked the serving size of that information. And if you are not sure whether uh, the nutrient information uh, is high or low, you can check the percentage column. That's the percentage of your daily intake. A higher percentage means that uh, uh, it contributes to a higher percentage of your daily needs. And next slide, please. And so here is an example of shopping list. I would like to highlight the fruit and vegetables that you should choose a variety of colors, uh, including the dark leafy greens, cruciferous vegetables, beans, and mushrooms. Always go for the fresh options if possible. However, the frozen option may be also good for long-term storage. And for cereals, uh, since they, uh, the manufacturers is likely to add sugar in, inside the cereals, uh, you can choose the plain one or you can check the labels to choose a lower sugar options. And next I want to highlight is the canned food. Always choose those with uh, lower sodium levels because uh, a lot of sodium is added to preserve the canned food during manufacture. 
Next slide, please. Yes, if you are not sure what is your nutrition needs, you may refer to the uh, dietary guideline that is published in your country. For example, in the Philippines, they have this uh, uh, food plate model to show the recommended proportion by food groups, which is shown on the right-hand side of the, this picture. And uh, it is recommended to have a healthy diet, which is less salt, fried food, and sugar to prevent chronic illness. And uh, on the bottom part, they pre uh, present a one day sample meal plan for healthy male and female aged 19 to 50 years old. And this is based on the recommended, um, re uh, recommended uh, daily calorie of 1,190 calories. If you have a lower sedentary lifestyle, then you may need less uh, energy. So um, for this meal plan, uh, you can see they have uh, free meals, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and also snacks in between. And I also noticed that they have recommended the fried fish, but it is uh, better to choose the non-fried option and uh, or other uh, healthier cooking methods, which I will cover in the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, and the second tip is about healthy cooking. There's two major factors for uh, healthy cooking. One is the seasoning and the second is the cooking method. And for seasoning, it's better to use herbs and spices such as a garlic or ground, ground pepper instead of salt and sauces. And the healthier cooking methods include steaming, baking, pan frying, stewing, or boiling. And try to avoid deep frying or barbecue um, because this cooking method involves a very high temperature. And uh, during that high temperature, the fat and protein can uh, easily form carcinogens. However, if you have to barbecue for some occasions, then here are some tips to reduce the cooking time. The first one is to cut the meat into small pieces. And the second is to flip and rotate more often during the barbecuing. And the third one is to pre-cook some of the ingredients before barbecue. And finally, is uh, not to eat the burnt part of the skin where the carcinogens is concentrated. Next slide, please. Yes, um, there's a lot of controversy about the uh, cooking oil in that um, the main controversy lies in the fatty acid compositions. From the left figures, you can see uh, the fatty acid composition for different oils. Indeed, you may have heard about good fats and bad fats. There are three types of fatty acids in general. Uh, the first one is saturated fatty acids, which can raise the bad cholesterol and increase the risk of heart disease and stroke. While the other two mono or polyunsaturated fatty acids can reduce the bad cholesterol. And you may have heard about the omega-3 fatty acid, which is one type of the polyunsaturated fatty acid and can only be made by plant. And fish is also a good source of omega-3 fatty acid because they eat a lot of marine plants. So when choosing the oil, um, vegetable oil is often preferred over animal oil because uh, of the saturated fatty acid content. As you can see from the figure, Butter contain a very high amount of saturated fatty acid composition, uh, which is shown in the orange bar. And for other vegetable oil, except palm oil or coconut oil, they are mainly high in poly and uh, monounsaturated fatty acid. Another factor you have to consider when choosing an oil is the smoke corn, because different cooking methods uh, involve different temperatures. For higher temperature cooking, then you need to choose the oil with a higher smoke point. So on the figure on the right is a figure prepared by the Hong Kong Consumer Council. They have tests on the uh, cooking oil smoke point. And you can see uh, the highest cook, uh, smoke point is the soybean oil, which, which is around 234 degrees. And usually those oil with high smoke point is uh, 
are recommended for deep frying, while those with lower smoke point, such as uh, extra virgin olive oil, is recommended for uh, salad. So the key message to choose a, a particular cooking oil is uh, a variety of cooking oil to suit your need instead of just sticking to one type of oil. However, you have to be uh, aware that no matter which type of oil, overconsumption of fat will lead to weight gain. Therefore, we should use less oil during cooking. Next slide, please. Yes, um, eating, how, eating out is a very common in Asian countries due to the convenience. And however, commercially prepared food are usually less healthy compared to homemade food. So it is always advised to prepare your own food whenever possible. If you have to eat out, here are some of the tips for your reference. For salad, use minimal salad dressing or avoid the fatty dressings and choose the healthier cooking methods uh, instead of the uh, deep frying or baking. And choose those food uh, which are high in whole grain or uh, high in uh, a whole grain rice or whole grain pasta whenever possible. Uh, when you have dessert, choose fruit whenever possible. And for beverages, choose water or unsweetened tea instead of those added sugar beverages. Always avoid the sauce. Even though you have a dish with a sauce, then try to avoid uh, eating the sauce with the food because the sauce is usually high in fat and salt. And also for some uh, soup noodles, if you uh, eat soup noodles, try not to drink the soup because uh, when they prepare the soup, usually a lot of salt is added in. The last advice is to share the dish with your friend's family so that you won't overeat. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay. So if you want to check the nutrient content of uh, some of the common food you eat, uh, you can check for some websites. For example, in Philippines, they have developed this website uh, to, uh, for you to uh, check the common nutrient content of uh, foods in Philippines. When you key in the uh, food, you can find on the right, they have a data button. When you click it, then you will get the nutrient information. But bear in mind that uh, it is usually displayed as per 100 grams. So you have to make some calculation and what portion are you eating? So don't just look at that uh, information. Next slide, please. So now I will uh, talk about some of the common dietary myths. Next slide, please. The first myth is uh, eating soil food increases breast cancer risk. Soil food, such as soil bean, tofu, and soy beverages, are rich source of plant estrogen called isobatrons. For many years, there was a controversy whether women with breast cancer should consume soil food. Recent studies suggest that soil foods are safe for breast cancer survivors uh, in a month that is similar to typical Asian diet, which is around one to two servings. And one serving is equivalent to one cup of soil milk or one third cup of tofu. So, and um, soil food can also be a source of protein and fiber. So that's why this uh, uh, claim is not true. So next slide, please. So the second myth is sugar fish cancer cells. The fear that sugar fish cancer cells may be based on the fact that cancer cells like to use sugar as the source of energy, which is same as other healthy cells in the body. Although this is true, it is not possible to prevent cancer cells from using sugar by just eliminating sugar from your diet. And because a lot of the fruit and vegetable and whole grain food contain certain amount of sugar. So this is impossible to avoid. However, it is recommended to avoid those empty calorie sugar food. For example, like soft drinks, candies, and uh, cakes. And because 
when you eat a lot of the anti-curry sugar, it will eventually turn to fat and store in the body and lead to overweight and obesity. And bear in mind that there's strong link between obesity and cancer risk. So the recommendation is to limit the consumption of uh, sugar sweetened drinks and other uh, sugar, sugary food that uh, with added uh, sugar. Next slide, please. Uh, so the myth free is organic plant-based food offer extra protection against cancer. For now, there's no solid evidence proving that organic vegetables and foods are better at reducing your cancer risk than similar food that is produced by other farming methods. There's a few studies suggest the nutrient values uh, of organic food may vary, and some of it have higher amounts of vitamin or minerals compared to conventional grown produce, and some indeed have lower amount. So there's uh, not a recommendation to eat organic food to uh, protect against cancer. Indeed, the uh, recommendation is on plant-based diet. And people who advocate for organic food concerns about the pesticide residues. You can avoid this by washing the fruit and vegetables thoroughly and peel if possible. Next slide, please. So the fourth myth is fasting can improve the effects and symptoms of chemotherapy. There is some limited evidence to support this claim and more studies are, are wanted to make a recommendation. However, um, this fasting is not advised for certain conditions, for example, heart disease, diabetes, or those with existing eating disorder. And there may be side effects such as headaches, hunger, weakness, and nausea. Next slide, please. Okay, the fifth myth is ketogenic diet can help reduce tumor growth. Ketogenic diet is a diet high in fat and low in carbohydrates. And the typical ketogenic diet composed only 5% of uh, daily calories from, color, uh, from carbohydrates, which is equivalent to the amount of one apple. Existing research is really restricted to lab and animal studies and single cases in humans. So um, the diet strict limitation on uh, starchy vegetables, whole grains, and fruits may lead to missing out some of the essential vitamins and minerals in your diet and can lead to malnutrition. There's other side effects such as constipation, diarrhea, fatigue, and because the diet is uh, very high in fat and long-term adherence is also very low. So when people who choose to follow this diet, they have to be <laughs> made available for all the Filipino patients. Right now, our Philippine National Formulary, I think there's an opportunity for us to really update that. <clears throat> and finally, um, you can see that there has also been significant progress towards education and access, access on the comprehensive genomic profiling. As of today, I think it has been made available since four years ago. Different companies are making it available locally. There have been expansions and there have been more than 1,000 Filipinos who have benefited from CGP. But that is a significantly low uh, number compared to the number of patients diagnosed for cancer each year. I think yesterday it was shared that based on the Global Can 2020 data, there are at least 27,000 Filipinos have been diagnosed back in 2020. So 1,000, I think we're going to get there, but it takes a community to do that. Over to the next slide. So this is actually very small, but 
listening to this, I think what I would like for us to have is what is actionable after listening to this session? What can you do to make sure that personalized healthcare, as mentioned earlier, is not a science fiction, but a reality? So the lobbying piece has already been shared. I think there's an opportunity for us, whether you are a breast cancer patient, a cancer patient, or caring for, for someone who has the illness, personalized healthcare goes beyond cancer. But we have to take accountability. We need to have a demand for it and lobby for it. I appreciate the example earlier from Myra, and I think we need to make a stand and come together to make sure that, again, specifically around not just a law, but the funding, adequate funding, gets actually implemented. The second that I'd like to highlight is around data privacy and loss. So the databases for these genomic profiling learns from the different genetic makeup of the people participating in the program. So we also have to make sure that the databases are easily accessible. But for me, specifically for the Philippines perhaps, what we can start is with electronic medical records to begin with. Maybe databases are advanced, but the EMRs will make it easy for us and for a national cancer registry to actually be in place. And then finally, I think what's not listed here, but I was now being inspired by the different countries, partnerships and collaborations across Southeast Asia. I think we can together with the different advocacy groups in different countries from Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines, how can we inspire our government to actually come together? How can we have a multi-country approach rather than an individual approach? Will our voices be louder if we do that? You know, is this something that you'd like to do in the next couple of days and start discussing? So with that, I'd like to go on to the last slide saying, um, you know, it, it's personalized healthcare is something that is meant for all of us. It's something that becomes a reality, but it will not be do. It will not come to life if we don't come together. The public sector, the private sector, at the center of it are the patients, and we can achieve this by working together to change the healthcare system. Again, having the right treatment for the right person at the right time. Thank you. I would like to invite Dr. Julie Grelo to the stage as well, and Dr. Hardy Luna uh, as the uh, reactor. You can see, yeah, it's it here. And, our, and Dr. Arthur Liu, uh, he's on online. He's online. Hello? No. Yes? It works? Yes. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. See, and I'm gonna start with you because you uh, didn't get a question. Um, you, you, you talked a little bit about the role of healthcare providers. You know, we talk a lot about advocacy groups and government, but, and you mentioned healthcare providers. In the Philippines, nurses and the, the, the nurses association is very strong. Um, how could you leverage their uh, influence uh, to really push for, uh, for these more personalized medicine? Thank you for that very interesting question I actually shared with Dr. Luna earlier. So I think the first thing that comes into mind is, again, a multidisciplinary approach. I think MDT is something that uh, we can further institutionalize and really leverage on not only for breast cancer, for, but also for the different types of cancers. Now with the role of nurses and especially to your point, right now we have an exodus of our nurses going to the other countries and more of these specialized nurses. I think most of them are you know, not wanting to specialize anymore or maybe wanting to go to different countries because they have the voice, but I think we don't have the system or consistent system to make sure that they become partners in that treatment. Because 
all of the infusions that are happening, um, of course, it comes from the doctor's orders, but at the same time, the, the personalization of that approach, how do you cater to the preferences of, of your patients, having a convenient way. Um, and I also want to highlight, let's say, even today, there are treatments around intravenous infusion, but also there are also subcutaneous formulations. But how are the nurses getting the information and giving also back to our healthcare professionals as to how you can further modify that? Because I think the nurse's role is also very important in terms of adherence. So that's what good looks like for me and how we can further promote that and also how we can have a specific program, let's say for the Philippine government, to ensure that our oncology nurses are definitely part of that and how we can also make them stay um, so that they can continuously evolve or transform the healthcare for specifically for breast cancer patients. Great. Thank you very much. Dr. Grelo, um, could you please, and you know, it, we were supposed to hear the general concept of precision medicine in the first uh, presentation, but we were unable. Um, and when we talk about precision medicine, our head goes immediately to targeted therapies, but there is more than targeted therapies. Could you just very quickly, as quickly as you can, summarize you know, the pieces like a diagnosis or for prevention or when in which stages do you use precision medicine in breast cancer? I think we should be using precision medicine from prevention to diagnosis, through treatment, and through survivorship care because precision medicine, you know, personalized medicine really is different at each stage. Um, we talk about it more with respect to treatment, um, but in the prevention piece, we need to know the family history, the genetics, the risk factors, and that can tell us when we need to do screenings and things mm -hmm. too. So I think it goes across all stages um, of the whole continuum um, of, of breast cancer. Thank you, thank you. And I would like to hear from our two reactors. Uh, I'll give the floor to Dr. Luna, who's here with us. Hi, good evening, delighted to be here. So basically um, our talk for this afternoon focused on the patient. So we have, again, it was Dr. Grelo uh, mentioned a while ago, it's the patient's journey from prevention to survivorship and um, gone are the days that we, we, we put them in a box. So um, for personalized medicine, there are efforts to improve on survivorship, um, mortality, morbidity by applying medicines. On top of that, we also have precision medicine in other specialties or fields as well, be it surgery, um, precision medicine in pathology, as well as uh, uh, precision in, um, in radiology. So there's improvement in science, but we... We in our country, in the Philippines, this precision medicine, the next generation sequencing is very costly still. Most of our uh, conversations with our patients in a government hospital, they would want 110,000 tests to be converted, uh, next generation sequencing tests to be converted to treatment already. So it's really a hard call for physicians, and it's also a great deal for patients because you're communicating the importance of genomic or personalized testing, but you also want to hear their um, voice in uh, committing to treatment already at this early stage in time. On top of that, access. I know there are a few access for next generation sequencing, personalized medicine, and the education about it. There are a lot of hesitations still because, uh, number one, of the cost. So I, uh, I honor the uh, comment a while ago about collaborations and helping each other support this, be it um, insurance, be it uh, policies in healthcare, etc. So there's a way or better, um, better path to improve science in that aspect. In addition, for the physicians, there's a lot of things we need to learn about precision medicine, uh, the precision testing as well. The platform, its interpretations, the, result, the results, it differs from one platform to the other. So we need to improve on this as well. Uh, so that's for the part of treatment. Then going to the earlier 
face prevention. I I am so amazed with the 30 day law mentioned by Dr. Myra a while ago. I hope we have some something like that in the Philippines because it matters. Early detection, early cure, it saves lives. However, in the Philippines, social media, misinformation, and uh, a lot of uh, second opinion from non-specialists really do cost time. This delay in time causing more, um, more fear cripples the patients. And instead of empowering them, it really causes delays. And how can we bridge more patients to survivorship? How can we... Uh, how can we say no to stage four if they themselves um, commit or or they themselves consent to these um, alternative uh, options? We're not saying that these are, 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 are bad options, but again, we need to communicate, educate, clinically evidence-based medicines from those that are hearsay. So again, the awareness... The support and the access. Some of the patients uh, will tell you, I have no funds for these uh, medicines, chemotherapy, even it's uh, cheaper nowadays compared to years before, like two decades ago. Um, still, they cannot afford it. So uh, I, I really honor the partnerships, the collaboration, the, the, the advocacy of everyone in this um, hall, um, be it government officials, uh, patient advocates, cancer support groups, even survivorships, because all together, together with the physicians, physician scientists, we all have the same goal to bring um, better medicine, to create better practices, and to have better survival outcomes for our patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Arthur Lowe, we would like to hear your reaction. It's a good day, everyone. Um, I hope I'm coming in clear. Okay, th thank you. Thank you for having me here. So just, um, I'm a medical oncologist uh, and I practice south of the Philippines. So um, first of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate the organizers and of course the speakers. It was uh, truly uh, heartwarming for me as a clinician to listen to the true advocates, the, the vision of the speakers that we had. Uh, that was something very uh, heartwarming, heartwarming to, to listen to. Um, first of all, I'd like to really just comment on, you know, how personalized medicine, precision medicine has changed over time. We've probably seen um, how we have improved in terms of how cancer care has evolved over the past, uh, I'd say, uh, one or two decades ago. Um, prior to this, everyone, you know, just get chemotherapy. That was all we had. We, we didn't know better at that time. Uh, over time, we've learned, especially in breast cancer, to know that, you know, not all breast cancers are treated alike. And I think this is the initial concept of personalized medicine. We've learned, you know, that, you know, a certain subtype of breast cancer responds better to this type of, of treatment versus um, this type of breast cancer may get a better outcome with another type of targeted treatment. A good example of which would really be HER2 uh, treatment for HER2 positive breast cancer. I think if you recall historically, um, I'm sure in the Philippines and in other parts of the world, everyone will get the same treatment as, as, um, as all types of uh, breast cancer. But we've learned how to do HER2 testing like here in where I practice uh, south of the Philippines, not in Metro Manila. We do have um, uh, good HER2 testing. We've learned how to do HER2 testing as, as routinely as we can. And that, I think, has really changed lives. Um, and I think that is where a lot of um, uh, research uh, should come in. Um, we should get to try to understand uh, more how to personalize a treatment for uh, breast cancer. Um, we've also learned a lot as well about, um, you know, uh, biomarker testing, testing early breast cancer, you know, which subtype, which subtype of patients will benefit from getting chemotherapy and which sub subset of patients who will not. Um, I think this has been brought up, Oncotype DX, uh, tests like these. It helps us um, um, uh, choose patients who to get treatment. We've also looked at around um, uh, how we have been having more uh, genetic testing, um, germline mutation testing, wherein 
we try to identify high risk individuals but i guess ultimately these are things that we we know that has improved over our over our how we treat our breast cancer patient but ultimately i think in the southeast asian uh, community in middle low income countries i think the question again as dr luna uh, mentioned earlier is this technology available? Do we make this personalized medicine um, available for only the select few? Or do we want to bring this to all the involved patients in the community? Um, I think that is something that we all have to reflect. And I'm sure a lot of things have been um, uh, um, uh, done, you know, meetings, advocacies, etc. So, um, truly inspiring, but I guess there's still a lot more things to do on this matter. Um, we cannot make something available only to a select few. It has to be something that has to be for everyone. Um, and again, the next question is, is it available? The next question is, if we get drugs, like in the metastatic setting, like in lung cancer, we've learned so much about personalizing treatment in lung cancer. Are the drugs available? Are the drugs accessible for these patients? That's another big question. You send a test to, to, for a patient and tests come out say, like, you know, you need drug XYZ. Is drug XYZ something I can bring into the country? Is it something that the patient can afford? And I guess um, that's also something that we need to at least improve. I've always looked at, um, uh, going back to the treatment, I've always looked at um, how um, research should support how um, uh, local scientists, and I'm sure, um, I think in other countries, we now have local panels, uh, local testing in university hospitals. And I guess for low middle income countries, that's something that we, we might need to look into. Having these tests locally available rather than sending them out takes th three, four, 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 four weeks to have results in. And, you know, making the low and middle income countries stand on their own. And I think that's something that over time might be something more sustainable for everyone. And I think hopefully will answer um, accessibility and availability of all these uh, new technology for our patients. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you very much. Very good reflections to, to end the session. Uh, the first speaker that we didn't hear, she ended her presentation saying two things, uh, collaborate and campaign. And um, I just, I'll leave it like that. Thank you very much for your participation and we'll close the session now.
Here are a few reminders before we begin. To enjoy a smooth conference experience, please make sure that you are connected to a stable internet connection. In the event of technical difficulties, just exit the session, refresh your browser, and log back in again. There are different rooms for different sessions. Please make sure to check the schedule posted on our Facebook page and on our official website to help you choose what sessions to attend. If you have questions about the sessions and or your viewing experience, feel free to approach our virtual help desk and one of our staff members will assist you. Thank you so much. We would like to remind everyone that the translation option is for our attendees outside of the Philippines. Please refrain from clicking the translation button to avoid confusion and difficulties. If you're from the Philippines and are in need of translation assistance, feel free to visit the help desk and we'd be happy to guide you. Thank you and we appreciate your understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all settle down and let us welcome to the stage our moderator for this session, Ms. Cess Orenia Drillon. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Oh, are you, well, okay. I would like to properly introduce you, but let me talk a little about our topic this afternoon. Uh, now that the internet is more prominent than ever, how do we marry digital technology with our advocacy? How do we bring our efforts online? So in this um, interesting segment, we have here our um, dear guest, who was once described to me by a very close friend as um, a renaissance person. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is into everything, name it, um, designing clothes, uh, he's had a flower shop, he's had a wedding uh, events company, an events company, he's a filmmaker, of course, um, uh, was president of an ad, still, not of an ad agency, and um, what he will well, he's an advocate as well. Um, uh, he is an advocate of a more active, creative industry in the country. And so he will hopefully teach all of us here how we can bring our advocacies alive on social media. He did a um, check on uh, I Can Serve's IG, <laughs> but I, I will not... Uh, uh, I will not uh, steal your, your presentation. So Marlon Rivera, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marlon. Magandang maganda. Salamat, sis. Uh, babating ko muna sa ating sa sariling salita. Magandang araw sa inyong lahat. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this is one I, I, I first heard of um, I Can Serve. 19 years ago, 20 years ago, so uh, from Cara. So I've been, you know, helping in and out um, for for the foundation. Um, when I was when I was when I was asked to to come, you know, to give a talk to share my my points of view on social media and advocacy. Of course, I checked 
I checked the I can serve I, IG and it has 558 followers. Okay. <laughs> nothing wrong with the small following, nothing wrong with numbers. Um, you know, Oprah only follows one person, right? That's Gail. So it's not bad to have one, you know, to be following one. Um, and we have a, such a thing as granular influence, which is about under 10,000 uh, followers. So, uh, you know, so don't, wor don't, worry, don't worry about it. What I want to share with you is my point of view as an interdisciplinary person. So I used to be in advertising as a creative person. I taught, it, uh, I taught visual and verbal communication. Uh, did social media. I'm an advocate for the creative industry uh, in the Philippines. That's a lobby group. Um, and the, the law was passed um, last year. Um, I also am part of what's called PETA. So I'm a chairman of the board of trustees for, it's a theater group. So that's, uh, that's PETA. Uh, I'm also the communications director of ACTOR. That's the Actors Guild of the Philippines and a member of the DGPI, which is the Directors Guild of the Philippines. So all over the place, I've been all over the place, and I want to share with you something that persists in all of these interactions, in all of these places, in all these spaces, uh, what persists. And that's what I want to talk about. What is social media? What is advocacy in social media? So advocacy in social media is like, um, it's like building a fire in the forest because it's dark and you want to bring everyone in for a, for a, for a, you know, for a storytelling idea. So you have a small fire in the forest while the whole forest is burning. Okay, that is social media, that's advocacy on social media. So I'll take you through a few ideas first, very quickly, you can interrupt anytime if you have questions. First is a definition of what advocacy is, obviously. What are the stages of advocacy, the classical ones? And then I'll talk about uh, the operational definition of social media, a very simple definition of what social media is and what's happening to social media now. And then I will share with you the three concepts in social media that you need to get you know, to get straight. What is management, what is marketing, and what is advocacy on social media. And I hope this can help you out. Now, why is social media? It's because everyone's on social media, right? In the Philippines, this is Philippine data. This is not, this is not of course, global data. In the Philippines, uh, we spend about 4.9 hours every day on social media. Most of that would be females, so mostly females it's higher, it's skewed towards moms, moms with, with kids, and then the males would follow after that. Now, 75% of engagement on social media in the Philippines is, of course, on Facebook, and the reason is because they want to connect. So the, the reason for social media in the Philippines is connection. Uh, causes and politics is down at from 75 to about 45, so it's rather low, no? People want to talk about music. So what, what, do, what do people do in so, on social media? They want to connect, especially moms in the Philippines. They want to post their pictures. They want to update people about their lives. So that's what we do on social media in the Philippines. During the pandemic, obviously, the, the, it, you know, it became a shopping, a shopping, a shopping place. Uh, and, and that's how we engage on social media. Now, all the data that we have is from the last quarter of 2021. And... Uh, when people are looking for information, they go to social media, right? They go to social media. Uh, but I want to give a caution on this one, okay? People don't go to people don't go to social media or online to look for facts. People look to go to social media to look for confirmation because that's the bias of the device, right? To say, you know, to type, is this true? People never go to the social media and say, how do I prove myself to be wrong? No one does that, okay? You're looking for pain, okay? So people will search for, like, to confirm their, 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 you know, their, their ideas. As I say, truth is always about what? Truth is a mix of information plus poured into a shape of called belief. So it's like water in a glass in the shape that you want, okay? So that's, that's, that's the, the truth, Diva. That's a composited truth. So what do we do in social media? Okay, so first, let's define advocacy. Advocacy, if... I hope all of us are advocates, right? My only curiosity in this group is this, all over the world is, do we share the same beneficiary of the advocacy that we're doing? Because advocacy requires who's the beneficiary, right? Who benefits from the, from the advocacy? Me, I hope it's the patient because advocacy is about who's, you know, who's getting the, 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 the blunt end of the stick, right? 
So we're all advocates. We're advocates. And um, advocacy is about what? It's about speaking for what is invisible and speaking for those who cannot speak for themselves, right? So that they can be in the places where their lives are determined or discussed in the policy spaces, you know, in the doctor's offices, in the pharma groups. So we are there to speak for them because they cannot speak for themselves. Of course, you can also advocate for yourself, right? But advocacy is simply that, right? It's like holding a torch in the dark and saying, look, I'm standing up for someone. That's advocacy. I have an idea and I would like you to look at this. As I said, except that the whole forest is burning also. So everyone has an advocacy. Every, everyone has, has something to say. So that's advocacy. Now, there are classic stages of advocacy, right? This education, meaning you want to get informed because information is critical, in, 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 very important. The second bit is engagement. You want to bring people in, you know, you want to bring people in. You want to engage the community. And then, of course, last is policy, right? You want to influence policy. Those three are the three hallmarks of advocacy. So, as I said, you want to learn, you want to engage, and then you want to influence policy. Now, the question is, that's, that's offline, but how does it happen online? You get it? There's a difference in those, 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 two, those two things, right? So, for example, information and knowledge is critical because the, the deeper your knowledge is, the more you can speak for your, for your causes or for the people you want to you 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 support. But on social media, it changes because information changes to emotion and stories. So it changes. So when, when you move, you know, move from, from um, real life to social media, that education part changes because everything is emotional. No one really, you know, I mean, no matter how big the decision is, no matter how, how, you know, how, how high involved the decision is, it's always emotional. We always decide emotionally and then we walk, we walk that mile with the logic. You know, we look for the data to support our feelings. Okay, so it's that. So it changes from... Knowledge should be about more about stories now. Second bit is that's education part. Engagement. Engagement in the traditional advocacy sense is like, you know, we go out, we talk to the formal groups, we give them, we give them uh, leaflets, you know, we want to engage, the, especially the community. On social media, the difference is that there's no geography to these things, right? So you don't have to walk, the, you know, like the whole mile because if you think of it as the Amazon basin, as the Amazon forest with all the, with the river, the tributaries, everything is now connected. So the good thing about advocacy, the, that engagement part on social media is that it's not geography based. You're not limited by space and time. The hard part is you have to build it. You have to build the community, okay? You have to build the engagement. I'll give you the metaphors on how to do this. So you can do this very quickly. So engagement is different in, on social media and these we maintain, right? The third part is policy. Now, in my experience with policy, lobbying for policy, it changes, you know, it changes a bit. In real life, what, what, who are the policy makers, right? So because what's important to them? Sometimes in the creative industry, our, 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 our stick is to argue for numbers, that we are, we are this big economic, you know, economic force, that we are a, a sector. So we have to tell them, you know, we're making 6.6 .6 billion every year and blah, blah, blah. We have about 60,000 people. And so this is like constituents, voters, and so on and so forth. So we have to translate our force into what they understand, right? So you have to find that same, you have to find that same argument for, for, your, for when you do for policy for, for breast cancer. I know the law can be passed, but the implementation can suck, right? I mean, I don't know about the other countries, but, you know, in the Philippines, it's usually the case. So we have, you know... It's signed, but the IRR is terrible, <laughs> and you don't have implementation, okay? So it depends on the fight. So on policy, on policy, it depends. Uh, but what's good about social media, when you move to social media on policy, is that when you're talking to lawmakers, you can apply the numbers then. This is where the numbers happen, you know, like we have so many people, we can crucify them, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, it's nothing but the big gun, okay? It's, 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 uh, it's public shaming. Where there's money, and if you don't pass this law, you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're dead if you don't do it. So the numbers can happen. So on social media, it changes a bit. If, and, uh, if in real life, education, engagement, and um, policy influence can be done face to face. And of course, you need, you need to really look for people, right? I mean, go to them and talk to your senators and talk to your, to your, to your community leaders. On social media, it's different. The pressure is applied differently. 
the pressure is like you know this is trial by by face okay trial by popularity this is quite different and it can be done and it can be done of course you have to raise your numbers right you have to raise your your numbers now if that's the difference i'll give you a metaphor on social media my first advice is you have to hire an expert right you have to hire it's someone's job if it's not someone's job if no one gets no one's getting paid if no one gets fired if it's not done it will not be done that is just the way of the world okay volunteerism is wonderful but volunteers are busy or you know not that engaged and you can only ask so much right you can only ask so much from volunteers so it would be nice if it's someone's job so hire an expert okay hire an expert it's easier that way so first we talk about social media management you've heard the word management management is the tending of your garden so it's like you know you have a little garden backyard and you look at the seeds you whatever seeds you find you you know you, you plant again assess would would know how, how this is done so it's the daily tending of the garden and usually tending of the garden is quite simple you put out the content but it's not about you the content is about the, the you know what you're trying to cultivate right so when you plant you know when you want pollinators you don't plant you you, you think of the plants that the pollinators would like right it's a tending you have to answer questions you have to, when people talk to you you have to interact social media is nothing the social media was invented as web 2.0 right it's nothing but interaction the moment the mechanism for interaction happened the comment the like button the moment it happened the moment people can talk back to you the moment interaction was invented social media was invented that is social media you can interact so you can make the interaction happen you can respond you can talk to them you can give them what they want you know you can you can interact it's not it's as simple as tending a garden right now what is social media marketing that's different that's the paid portion of it that is like having a garden but you're buying what seedlings you're buying potting soil from the garden center maybe you're paying for someone to come and do the the irrigation and the the, the, the watering of the plants so it's a paid if it's marketing it's paid it you can actually pay for management but you can do it yourself but you have to be good at it you have to be constant at it now social media advocacy is different social media advocacy is what it's like burning the forest you get it it's forest management meaning you have to look at everything that grows in that forest and say how do i make more people care about what i care about that is just advocacy right how do i bring more people in so sometimes you engage the forestry you sometimes you it's not about it's not about it's like have you seen the the, the footage on the fires the forest fires of australia do you know that they're about every every year the, the forest the size of the whole philippines is about 78 you know acres 78 million acres get you know burns down every year but no one cares about that every day 200,000 acres are burnt from the forest of the world but what really what really got out was the, the panda that was i mean the koala that was burning right the koala that was saved by this you know firefighter and this woman they gave him water and of course you know he was bandaged in the end that's what drives social media so in the forest fire sorry no one cares about the big the big fires people care about the small the small things in the forest right so that is social media taking care of a forest and then burning the forest okay that's how the, we have to burn the forest because okay i came from an industry where we always approach our job with with desperation not humility desperation because advertising no one cares about us no one wakes up in the morning and says i will see more ads today i will look at i will read the newspaper and look for more print ads i will listen to more you know radio commercials no one does that we're always defensive because no one cares about what we do so what are we good what did we how did we train ourselves we wanted to become we want to catch your attention and thank god because what do we have now we have called an attention economy right so we have to catch people's attention so that's what we, we, we we've been trained to do okay so that's a, that's why i said burn the forest because otherwise if, if you don't burn the forest if you don't set a fire no one will pay attention right because everyone's life is everyone's you know 
your life is more important than anyone else's life. Sorry, I mean, there's altruism. Believe you me, there's altruism. Science proved it, has proven that. But people really, really you know, care more about what's happening to them. The most important question to ask in, in social media is, so what do you think? How are you feeling today? Look at the Facebook prompt, prompt. What's on your mind? The most beautiful subject matter on social media is us. It's us. I mean, me, you, diba? It's not about other people. The most shareable things on social media be three things. The thing that can make me look cool and funny. It can make me look smart. And it can make me look like I'm making a difference. So on social media, what do we do? When we have an advocacy, we don't ask them to solve the whole breast cancer problem. We have what's called the finite asks. We only ask for that small thing, right? ALS, you, see, you saw the ice bucket challenge, right? What is the only ask there? Do the ice bucket challenge. And the only termination point of that, it doesn't cure everything, but it, it, it makes people aware of the, of the ALS. And of course, to raise funds for research, right? Me Too was not going to solve the whole misogyny problem, right? But it makes, it makes women come out and say, you know, me too. I was, I was abused, right? Look at mental health now. They're not saying we'll cure mental health. What is the only trick to the mental health advocacy these days? There's no trauma. It's okay to speak about it. So talking about it is, 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 the, is, the, is the thing they're asking for, right? When there was a storm, uh, of course, you know, we, 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 do race, we, we do fundraising for storms in the Philippines. It cannot be stormed for every, every year, for the whole year. We have to be, this is like Ulysses PH. Solve that problem, okay? It's every storm. Every storm, we have to ask a new hash, ask for new things, new hashtags, new drives. So it has to be limited because people cannot solve, people don't have the bandwidth for everything. I know you're trying to get people to help you end to end, you know, from pre diagnosis to survivorship to the 23 to the 30 year survivorships of people. You want to take care of them. What, what do you do after diagnosis? What do you do after this? What do you do when this happens? What do you do if this is a, recurring, a recurrence? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? And you want to help everyone along the line. But on social media, if you want to go with there, you have to be, keep it small, personal, but you have to make the, fine, the ask to be, when I say the ask, what are you asking for? Finite. Because one, you want to say, what, how can I make a difference, right? Every, you know, je suis... Whatever, that, whatever the new French thing is, uh, Black Lives Matter, all these things. All these things are about boiling, boiling over. Lastly, I'm sorry to say this, but in the Philippines, in the Philippines we, don't like to, we don't like to talk about heavy stuff. Like, oh my gosh, breast cancer. Oh, I'm triggered. It's death. You're not going to die yet, but you get it. I mean, it's a, it's an, it's an. I'm sorry to say this, but it's an. No, it's. I think it's the highest. Is it the, the number one killer and number one cancer in the Philippines now? It is, right? So you get it. It's a problem that will not go away yet. I hope it goes away. But you get what I'm saying. It will always be there, and we'd rather sweep it under the rug, right? So it's hard to it's hard to engage people and say, you know, why people don't help. I don't want to say this. You know, I don't want to help some people because it's a downer. Oh God, it's so sad, diba? So it doesn't, as long as it doesn't affect you personally, you don't want to get there, right? So we have to find tricks. So from here on, I've shown you the difference in advocacy. Yes, you can do advocacy, but you have to boil it something, burn something to burn the forest so people will pay attention. And you have to have that ask, that, that limited ask. And the way to build it is what? It's just stories. It's all about stories. It has to be a personal story. I'm sorry, but I can serve, you know, you're there. You're, can you recommend for I can serve? Oh, come, look at, your, look at your IG feed. It looks like a bulletin board. I mean, I mean, I mean okay. look, okay. First, first, first. Okay, I would like to say congratulations because, you know, we've been doing it for so long. There's an offline, there's an offline task, right? But if you look at the social media, it looks like announcements. Do you want to engage with announcements? I mean, it's like, you know, a set of flyers, beautiful flyers. They're pale pink, you know, nice pastel colors, but they're just a wall of announcements. Someone gave us money. Someone, it's not engaging, right? Because what engages us, again, is going back about to personal stories, right? It has to be personal. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There's a one. There's, I think, I think breast cancer now. They have 88,000 followers. The midline is about 30. That's, um, that's um, re rethink breast cancer, right? If you look at their feed, they have more places, journeys, like this is how I started. And I know sometimes it's exploitative to talk about people's misfortune and sadness, but that's what people are here for on social media. So, yeah, that, that's something you can you, you should think about. Do you have any, you have any questions before we, we lock down the prescriptions? I don't want to go prescript. I want to go descriptive first before I go to prescriptive ideas. Oh, well, at this point, let me uh, bring in our uh, reactor. Join us here, uh, Tish. Oh, yeah. Well, Tish is a lifelong advocate for the rights of the world's of girls and women. She is also co-founder of the Women's World Wide Web, leader of a uh, lead organizer of TEDx New York for four years. Also a poet and a writer. Hi, Tish. Stand lang. Okay. Oh, sige. Um, before the prescription. <laughs> Oh, nga, parang yeah, maybe, our mics um, are no, the voiceless and the invisible. You want? Hindi ko lang masagot safe na mag-share ng microphone. Nato na lang, di ba? I think that when I'm just listening to what you're saying, one of the challenges is we're a bunch of hypocrites. We're a country that, a culture that is always nagmamalinis, always presenting the good side. Um, and it's a challenge to make someone look at something that's so unpleasant, so real, so raw. There are a few things that come to mind. There's a SCAR project. There are these women on social media who bravely show their scars. Um, and I don't know if that's going to appeal in the Philippines, but I think um, parang you're making me think of everything is a love story. It's the opposite. Every feeling is some form of love. Galit na galit ka kasi you love because you care. And I think um, uh, so that becomes this very nuanced mystery box. Everybody loves a woman, a mother, a sister, a lover, a partner. Everybody loves a woman's breasts. <laughs> Source of nourishment, source of pleasure, source of fashion. How do we make that something worth caring about, worth talking about, worth looking at, um, worth examining? Um, and maybe, you know, I hear from the breast cancer community that often what happens is you become reduced to your cancer. The wholeness of the person is lost. Even an oncologist wants to remove the breast, wants to just talk about the cancer. And often the wholeness of the person is forgotten and perhaps um, this is such a good reminder that there is an entire person yeah. to which that breast belongs or belonged, which was messed up by cancer. And those are stories that people, maybe like accidents, will look at no matter how difficult. Um, and I don't know if that's the kind of reaction you were wanting, but I think, um, you know, <laughs> we've had our head in the sand about so many things as a people. We've endured so much. Um, and I honestly feel that the counter to all this toxicity and divisiveness is in being creative, in elevating to something artful, artistic, um, uh, and that transcends facts, that transcends science. And it is truly where unity will be found, not to be political. Um, yeah, and I think part of what we now have to do is uh, take pleasure in the privileges that we have in every waking moment, in every day that we get, um, and see what we really want to fight for. And I think one point, I love the specificity, the finiteness. If it is about early detection, if it is about touch your boobs and find out what's there, then that is the thing that we get people to do. Magpahipo ka. That's something that might pick up. or um, And then the rest of it, which is important, um, we can put it like a Trojan horse, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> wow.
yeah? uh, just to react to the reaction. I, 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 diba, it, everything is cultural. I know there, some people will be watching this from other countries, and it's going to be cultural. Culture is the operating system of anything and of the whole peoples, right? So what 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 uh, Chish was talking about is really cultural. Hey, look at it. Look at it this way. We don't we self medicate. We don't go to the doctor. Our first line of defense is itulog, inuman ng tubig, or bix or dasal, di ba? So we don't like to go to the doctor. That's why Clusibol years ago had that uh, bowel makasakit. Uh, these are these are all insights we find in advertising, right? These are all advertising uh, nuggets that we find. No? People don't. Filipinos don't want to go to the doctor. Culturally, because I think we also, I mean, economically, because we feel that if you, go, if you find out that something's wrong with us, it will, it will cost. It will cost us. Right? So we want to delay that, 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 that truth right? about that. So that's, that's, one of, that's one of them. The second bit is, of course, as you said, the hypocrisy. Right? The hypocrisy. The objectification. I'm sorry to all the women in the world and in the room. Right? The objectification of the woman and the Subobjectification of the breast, and it, and it, you know it gets it bastos, diba? So there, there's it, it it prevents conversations. It prevents uh, you know it it's it's a police state. It's a police territory, right? It's a police territory. So it's hard to to bring a lot of conversations around it. So that's that's also hard. So it's very cultural. It's very cultural. But what I like about what what I can serve is doing, for example, in dibdibin mo, diba? So there's a way into the language of how to how to talk about this because dib dib obviously is you know Filipinos you understand this right dib dib is your the chest right dib dib and dib dibin mo it talks about the heart you know take it to heart so dib dibin mo is take it seriously diba take it seriously feel it diba so it's about this geography of where it can the, the cancer is but it's also an attitude to taking it seriously so ginagawa ng I can serve yan diba they're doing that right um, I can serve that. Dib dibin mo. So there's a way into the language. And the language you yung hipuan, go for gold, di ba? Don't examine. You know, hipo, di ba? Lamasin mo kung kailangan. We have, to, for me, I'm a, I'm a writer by, by, as an advertising guy, I'm a writer by profession, a copywriter. So my, my, my field is language. And the more, the more, I don't, the more na naaamoy, the more you can smell the word, the better for us, right? Yung naaamoy mo yung salita, di ba? Because we like to be polite about it, diba? We like to euphemistic ang Pilipino, diba? Pumanaw sa makabilang parlor, alam niyo ganun, yung mahina siya ngayon, diba? We don't want to talk na namatay, na tigok, diba? Diba, yung ganun. So, we have, we have, I think the battle, for me, because it's what I know, in social media, the battle is language. It's language. Kailangan na mo yung ang hit, diba? Yung, yung burnik nung salita, yung, you get it? You have to smell that. Because if you can smell the word, you can smell the word. Then it's a redolent word. It's a resonant word. It means it means something from us. And again, that's burning the forest, right? That's burning the feelings, di ba? Kasi no one, no one pays attention. Wala namang, wala namang, walang, walang kumita sa, sa kung sa nanay ko, walang kumita at walang reward ang silent suffering. Suffering is just that. Suffering, okay? Sabihin mo, di ba? Sabihin mo, di ba? Wala niyong parang titiisin ko na lang to. Inanay ko ganyan eh. Sakit ang ulo ko. Bakit yung nagsalita? Titiisin ko na lang to. Ma, walang premyo sa nagtitiis. Diba? So you get it? So, that's very cultural. I mean, I, I, I love it that you mentioned it. Because it is cultural. Our problem is also not just medical, economic. It's cultural. And social media is in the cultural space. We tell each other what? 50 stories a day. To ourselves, to each other, about each other. Marites. Self-script, you know, self-hate, self-loathing. We tell that many stories. The more we tell these stories to ourselves, the more we repeat them, the more they become our truths and blah, blah, and so on and so forth. It's called scripts, right? It's called scripts. So, yeah, the culture has scripts and we have to fight that. So how often is, um, what do you think for an advocate? How often should she put the message out there? Uh, well, the, the, you know, the, the classical numbers would be at least four times a week. That's, that's a picture post. And then four times a month of a reel. You know, I mean, the, the, you know, the, 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 the video type, diba? Right? So you have to have that. It has to be a predictable time. Because people follow you. If you have this predictability, then you follow, right? That is the, that is the, that is the, the, the weird thing about the internet. 
they want you to be predictable. Even you know, they want you to be predictable. So yeah, four and four. Uh, I mean, in my mind, that's it. You know, four times a week because that's what we do when we do when we do contracts with you know influencers, right? <laughs> so you know, four, four times, four times a week, a post, and then at least four times a month on the reel on the video type. That's it. But you have to look at it every day. That's a repeatable time. You can automate all of these things anyway. I said hire an expert, automate it, diba? So that's that's those are the the numbers. And if look at it. If you want to talk a lot, go to Facebook, which is where the Filipinos are. If it's a picture, go to IG, right? If it's a link article, go to, to Twitter. So they have different, they, have, they serve different things. That's my only rule in my head. If I want to, if I want to chat, blah, 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 I go to Facebook. If I want to, if I want to put a picture or, or a video, I, of course, video, there's no TikTok, I go to IG. If it's a long article, it's a link, I go to, ironically, a short format called Twitter is best can handle you know can handle links better articles better than Facebook would ever do, so you know those are the the things that you can you can try to do. But please look at your look at your stuff every day you know and talk to people. And it's not about them; it's about who their audience is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I don't mean to be a you know a, a dark cloud, but yes, it's about them. I mean, you know, it's a courtship, right? I mean, social media is always a courtship. I mean, people follow you because they tell you, because you inspire me. But, you know, of course, it validates them, right? I mean, it, it inspires them. But so it has to be about the followers also. I told you at the start, I said, I come from a job where we always operate from a, from a point of insecurity because no one cares about what we do. Sorry to say that. The second bit is that we're always targeted. We always target people. In the advocacy space, what I see is a lot of choirs talking to the choir, you know, choir members talking to the choir members. You really care about each other, like you love each other, you're desperate, you're stuck together, you have no choice, right? Advocacy is asking those who don't care about us to care about us, meaning policy people, you know, business people, brands. So that doesn't say it has to be about the other. So usually it's, that's forgotten. It's like a conversation amongst themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, I mean, I understand, who, who would understand you more than you? You already do, right? I, you, that's a lived experience. Now, look at it this way. Money doesn't, in fundraising, of course, these are like, you know, like data from like 2016 or one of those. In fundraising, you're, the most amount of money that you get doesn't come from individual people, right? It comes from fewer sources, fewer individuals. So what that means is that your Pareto law is like that, right? You get 80% of your funding from 20% of, of your funders. So you have to talk to people who are not necessarily a bleeding heart, you know, like a lived experience sort of in this, in this, in this, in this idea. Um, so, I mean, of course, there are people who really care. I mean, what is it? there are people who really care, but usually they don't care. So must you also hire an ad agency to do these things, to have a campaign for you? Uh, no. No. <laughs> I, I, I came from Kasi an ad agency. No, 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 I, I mean, that's, that's my, that was my bread and butter for 35 years. Okay, So that I worked in an agency for that long. But you can do it pro bono. Yeah, you can do it. But it's no, you have to pay someone. Mm -hmm. uh, if I said, if no one gets fired, you know, if the job is not done, it will never be done. Uh, because a volunteer is like what you know, it's bandwidth. You know, it's bandwidth. So, parang, oh, I'm sorry, I'm 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 tired today. Okay, I'm mean, gonna tell you work, diba? So what you do is, but I think you can hire specialists now. You know, my advice I was telling Kara, you can actually hire people from not within the Philippines. I'm sorry to say this, I'm not taking away jobs from the Filipinos, right? But you can hire some from New Zealand, from Australia, from Singapore. There are people who who specialize in management and marketing, social media management marketing. And I've seen the contracts, it's quite good. It's 110,000 for a month. And it's very, very clear. You know, KPIs are clear. They can repurpose your content. They can repost, they can... It's a very clear science. So you can hire someone to do it for you. And, you know, in the scheme of things, uh, the returns are, you know, quite good. I mean, it's, it's, there's, there are good returns for social media because it can be leveraged as numbers. It starts to work when you start to talk to brands, when you start to talk to... Why shouldn't brands care about, you know, about the, they should care about our cost, right? So, yun, you, you, can, you can hire someone. Not an agency, not necessarily. 
Tish, chime in at any time, please. And if we have any questions, please. We'd love to. May, may you pass the mic? And Tish, please do chime in at any time. I, I think in terms of engagement, it's it's pretty clear. Thank you so much uh, for your for all the tips and tactics and all the um, the, the background here. Um, what about practical things? Uh, a practical objective, let's say policy. You, you mentioned how to make things happen. So what's 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 a good uh, format then? Because at the end of the day championing um, stories on overcoming adversities and um, sickness, that's, that's ongoing, right? How to make things happen with policy that really then will address uh, access, for example? Uh, how do you work on policy? Okay, the question is, does it work on social media? Yeah. Okay, the, the, not, not everything works on, through social media. Like when we were doing, when we were doing creative. For instance, as a concrete example, cite how you got um, uh, the law on the creative industry uh, the CIT, incentives. Yeah. Creative and, industry uh, bill of the yes, Philippines. Passed. Of course, there's a lot of us, right? There's, there's, there's a, whole, a whole bunch of people. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big machinery. Mm -hmm. um, but the strategy there was really to, uh, it's a one-on-one, -on -one, eh? We had to close in on the people who are voting. So we're counting like, oh, you this, had is going, chart. this is going, this is going like 24 senators this is going up that way. Who's, who's for it? Who's probably not into it? So it was, a, it was like a basketball game. You strategize the court and then you man to man, you have to go to, for one person each. So we have to find a person who connects to that person and not necessarily another famous person. If so social the, media was not a factor. No, social media, we, we did yeah. social media. We did social media. Social media said it's just crucifixion, right? It's the Calvary of, of the famous people. If they see it being hot, they'll say, oh, it's hot. Because if it's hot, then it's discussed, right? And of course, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm low, I'm low to say this, but a lot of, you know, a lot of lawmakers also like feel like, hey, I want to be in that, I want a piece of that fame. I want a piece of that heat, right? So it was m more to trigger the interest yes, yes. of... And you, you bring in, Le, you know, you bring in Lea Salonga because Lea Salonga is, was, was, was sympathizes with the bill, right? I mean, Kenneth Kubompue, I mean, so you bring the, you know, you bring the, the, the big guns. Because, because I said, Diba, no one, no, one will, no one will know that, that you have this fire in the forest if you're not burning the forest, right? I like that metaphor a lot, eh? because if you have this little fire in the forest, then okay. But if there's a big fire in the forest and people say, oh my gosh, it's a big fire. Those are the famous people, the heavy engagement. Of course, you can also boost your, you know, but it's really the viral things, you know, the big, the big, the controversial, the push, you know, the push. Maamoy mga salita. That's what you try to do. Uh, that's what you try to do. So on, I think on breast cancer, I think the problem is, if I may guess, I, think, I don't think the problem is policy. Eh? I think the problem is implementation. Eh? Get it? Because you can do you can do things together, right? You can communities are very important. You can come together. You can buy in bulk if you want, and so on and so forth. But you're always gate naka gatekeep kayo, di ba? I mean, you get it. The IRR, the budgets is slashed somewhere else, di ba? Uh, if the funding is gone, uh, the you know you get it. So that's where the influence need to be pushed. Of course, it's not it's not unique only to breast cancer. I mean. It's it's also the same for other for other, you know, the ailments, diba? But it depends what their aim is. Is it awareness? Is it money for? Is it increased government spending? Is it really, like you yeah. said? You said it has to be finite. Yep. Clear. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> remind me. Remind me. Of course, you have, to, you have that's an objective, right? That's called accountable thinking, right? Meaningful and accountable work. That's important. It's called strategic work, right? Meaning, you know what it will ha what it will do. And you know that you can you can measure it afterwards. That's what Tess is saying. Yes. So it depends on what you want to do. How do you find what what do you need to do? You look at the whole system. It's called barriers and levers, meaning what gets in the way, what moves things along. And you say, in this kind of a mechanics mechanism, where can we where can we put the, the pressure so it affects the whole system? Because you cannot you cannot apply it on the whole system, right? You have to find the barrier or the lever. 
to have the best results, right? To have the biggest results. So I don't know if the, the barrier here for you is, is the barrier about, is it a cultural thing? I don't know. I think people know about breast cancer, right? Mm -hmm. People know that it also affects men. It also affects families. Breast cancer is not a woman disease. It is, it's not a breast disease. It's a human disease. It's about the whole family, right? It's economics, right? Maybe it's about early screening. That's one. And you, 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 you don't have to, it's, an, it's, not an, it's not an all or nothing game, guys. Huh? Have an objective and then work at it because you can only do it, you know, like at a certain, at a finite time, right? But have a finite asks. Ako, for example, what do, we, what, do we, what do you do when you're diagnosed? You know, the first thing, the first thing, the first thing, the first thing that happens to you. Cry. Yeah, diba? That's the moment, that's the moment that you need to, under, that we need, that, that, that's not pushed out into the media, right? There's early detection, but people don't want to have an early detection because you might detect something, and when I find out, what do I do, right? Because when you do, when you find out, everything changes, right? The knowledge You'll never go back to how you came in through that experience, right? So the question is, what do you do when you first hear about it? Maybe if there's a support system that I know, but if the moment I find out, 20 women would come to me, survivors, and everyone would come to me and say, don't worry, this is what we will do. If someone can take away that, I can autopilot, that's an ask. That's a very specific ask, right? That moment of finding out, what do you do? The other point is, what do you do when you run out of resources? That's also a moment that you can talk about. That's an ask, right? The ask is, you know, a recurring, when it comes back, when it comes back, what do you do when it comes back, right? You can be in remission for so long, but when it comes back, what do you do? So you can look at the, the whole journey as, as these things and you can find what your asks are. I think we already asked everyone to help, right? I mean, you know, like, you know, there's, there's practical, there, there, there's a whole administration of, of, of resources that you need when you, have, when you have breast cancer or any disease, for that, any cancer for that matter. But what's unique to you are these things. So um, that's something I would like to, to make specific about. So thank you, says for, we can build a strategy, you know, keep in touch. We can build a strategy for this on, on social media and we're all willing to help so that you can lock it down to that specific task. I wonder if there are other um, uh, experiences around ASEAN. Would, would you be able to share who's successful? Are there successful social media campaigns in our neighboring countries? I wonder. Anyhow, Tish? Yes, please. Sure, of course. Hello. Hi, I'm Giselle from I Can Serve. So uh, my question is like, so we've hit that stage in our Facebook page that we're, we're at, we're at 11,000 followers now and it, it keeps growing. It's not something I'm happy about because but the more followers you have, it means the more people are getting breast cancer and looking for information. But anyway, but the problem is because the algorithm of Facebook is so bad. Like I said, the more followers you get, the harder they make it for people to see your posts, right? So we're like, I mean, you know, we don't have a, a budget for advertising. So it's really just volunteers. Please ampl amplify the, the posts. Just post them, repost them, share them. But that's so inadequate then. So like, what's the best way to counter like the greed of the Facebook algorithm? By <laughs> like, what's the way to, is there a way to hack the algorithm by harnessing our network of volunteers? Or is there no solution then to just pay for the ads? Um, well, no, you can, be, you can be selective with, like, who do you want to reach? Again, look at the mechanism, right? Who needs to hear your message that, that, that can make a difference? You, you get what I'm saying? I mean, is there, a sim, is there a single lawmaker? Is there a single, you know, the, the department head that needs to hear about this? Okay. And you can be intentional about it. Because I think you're, now you're just talking to the, to the world, right? You're to the wind. And when you're talking to the wind, you're, you're, at, you're at the mercy of the algorithm. And you will be. And there's no way of hacking it. Yeah. Okay. No, no. We, I think, no, there's three okay, points. No, case in point is right now. Like, we have, we have we're, we're promoting every one of the sessions. And, and you know, the, le the weeks leading up to this, you know, we were posting and posting. And then the reach 
even though our numbers were going up, our followers were going up because of this event, the reach of each post was diminishing. diminishing so like, yeah. oh my God, what's happening? Our numbers are going up, but our reach is getting low. So this, this, this CBAX right here. So case in point of how Facebook is bad Facebook <laughs> for wants advocates. Your money. The algorithm is Facebook so bad. Facebook is after your money. Yeah. It's just what's happening. They see that there's fire. They're like, It oh, is not the friend of advocates, right? No, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. Yeah, I mean, I just want you to, I, I'm sorry to hear that. There are strategies, we can always strategize for this. But that's what I'm saying. Reach is paid for. You have to pay for reach. Even in classical advertising, reach and frequencies are paid and repeats and so on and so forth. So you have to pay for it. Now, the, the, look. The, the, is, it, is it going to be a wise expense, though? No. For me, no. For me, I mean, no. Personally, I don't think so, because you're prob your your. This is a, just a guess, right? This is a guess. Last, I think the people who will make a difference in for your for the cost of breast cancer, the treatment, you know, the the end to end care and all of these things, is not somewhere on Facebook. You get it? I would raise my followers and whatever you know. I'd make I'd excite. I burn that whole F, F Facebook forest. Just have the, the numbers for it. But I think who will make a difference here? It has to be a man-to-man -man talk. It has to be an offline thing. You have to find that person who will make a difference. Is it going to be a corporation? Is it going to be a... Remember, that's how it looks, huh? You think Obama's money came from everyone, the public? No, I mean, you know, 70% came from, you know, you know, small identified funders, right? Do you think it'll come from the public? No, it usually comes from corporations. So that's the that's the myth. That's the myth. So I, on that note, the same as the, the creative industry bill, CIP bill. Now we're into the freelance bill, man, for the next round. The point is to find the person who will make a difference. Again, intentional, meaningful, accountable work. You don't have to talk to the wind. Somebody just need one person or a single group two people to make a difference. And I think break it down into yeah. campaigns with Pass, specific yes. goals. Yeah. If it's about reach, then take advantage of other people who have wide reach. Mm -hmm. No person will say, I'm not going to allow you to tag me for breast cancer awareness. That's a shameful thing. No yeah. one will do that. <laughs> Everyone's vain. Everyone wants to have compassion and appear to be compassion. Um, and I think, yeah, it depends on what you're after. Um, and to your point, no one to shout to everyone, no one to... Um, the task, lastly, the task is long. Offline, online, social media, non social media. The task is long. It's long and hard. And this is the only thing I've learned, not from social media, but life in general. The people who can see the end from the start to finish and can break it down and say, today I will take care of this. Because it will lead me to this and lead me to this and lead me to this. So those who can chop the task and bring you to that to the to the end point are the ones are, are the ones that really that really matter right are the ones who would make it work today for me it's just one thing and then another thing you cannot have everything i'm sorry but you cannot have everything but you can have something today get it you can win something small victories you no know, then move on move on that's what you're doing right the same as you've lived day to day Strategically, it's the same. What needs to be done today? So cut it up, cut it up, and it can be done, and it can be done. Any model social media campaigns of advocacies that, that come to mind? Meron bang advocacy sa Pilipinas? O sa ibang bansa, o saan About that IHA campaign. The what? The? The IHA, remember? IHA. What? Do I remember uh, there that? There were these young women, uh, they felt it was ageist and sexist, that they were referred to as IHA. So they had this conversation, and I, I can't remember the hashtag. See, we don't even remember. See, we don't even remember, right? <laughs> but that's the problem with the Philippines, eh? Di ba? Meron lang, parang two bits lang yun. I think Gabriela has had some. Oh, yes, 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 yes. But uh, that, is, that is not a social, that's not social media. Uh, that is an, a real organization, real life organization that's working, diba? Offline and then online, diba? That's different. But yung, yung purely operating on the social media space, 
The Philippines forget, di ba? Ngayon, inaaway natin ngayon si Raho Laurel sa Drag Race Philippines. Next Wednesday, iba nang usapan natin. <laughs> In fact, by Friday, nang kahapon pa lang, antak na pinag-uusapan, di ba? You, we, we don't remember these things so well. We have very short, short memories. Attention span. Attention span, yes. That's why, chop it, cut it up, cut it up. Intentional, accountable, meaningful work. Those three qualities must happen. Again, intentional. Intentional, meaningful, meaning, meaningful, it makes a difference, meaningful. And accountable, it can be measured. Those are the three things for me. That's like, that's how to think about everything that you need to do. Meaning, you want to do it, it because it will make a difference, and it can be measured in the end. That makes for that makes a big difference in everything you'll ever do in your life. And what time frame is the uh, apt for a, a good social media? campaign or it depends on your objectives it depends on really what you what you set out to do for the day uh, because objectives can mutate naman eh. they can mutate they can you know they can evolve over time uh, you can burn things today but you know like tomorrow it will fade but you can keep at it so there's no contracts working contracts are like monthly stuff you know that's monthly to six months they give a discount if you take them with the six month contract but the objective, when is it going to be fulfilled? It's not, I mean. Mm -hmm. It's Mick here. It's, uh, I was just thinking it's like a team. And I'm not a sports person. I was looking for Mick because he plays football. But every campaign has a role on the team. Some people are offensive. Some people are defensive. Some people are neutral. I think if you think about the different jobs that have to be done, what's the job of this? This one is going to shout. This is going to be whatever. This has to be a little offensive. I think that might, um, where it's all organized, it has intention. There's meaning. They know what, the, the campaign knows what job it has. I, because, yeah, it's not all going to be rosy. Um, and some of it, because uh, everyone's in, there's so much denial, whether at the personal level or at the policy level, you have to uh, shout a little bit, burn yeah. some forest or two, yeah. We are down to our last, like, oh, wrap up. <laughs> no, no more questions from the floor? Okay, one more, and then I guess we'll ask for your party. This is Shop not a Marlon. question. Um, I am Feli Atienza of Cebu. I can serve Cebu. I was very touched with your talk when you said that uh, we are, I mean, we are one, you know? We are one. And social media is very important. You see, um, uh, I was, uh, I had cancer four months after the death of my husband. So I have two children who are in high school. You know? So I'm, I'm alone. So, I said, but I, have, I am 23 years survivor now, thanks be to God. So when I, see, when I see a cancer patient or a cancer survivor, I would like to tell everybody that this I Can Serve Foundation is a great social media because many or some no, of our sisters just um, ask us, can I join your group? And he is a can she is a cancer survivor. And now we are very many in the Cebu I Can Serve Foundation that includes the whole of, even the whole of the Philippines. So it is so good to have a social media, even if you just shout out in your Facebook, somebody will ask and then you will feel and I will tell her, you're not alone. We are on this together. God is good, and we are healed in the name of the Lord. And even if we die now, but we are together in our own advocacy. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. Thank you for sharing. But I think Marlon said you must make other people who don't, who are, don't have cancer or are not surviving yeah. care about what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yung mga hindi na cancer Dapat kasali pa rin sila. Yeah. Always advocate Other women, together. healthy yeah. women. In our social media, 
There are some families who has cancer as a patient or survivor within their family. And they also ask us if they can join, the, the, the sister or a family can join us. Some right. of my friends, no? I uh, added that to social media because they know that I'm a cancer survivor. Thank you. And I can serve, really, uh, make us happy, and I think live longer. <laughs> and imagine after 23 years, you're still involved. That, that I'm 69 years old, <laughs> and I'm still active. <laughs> Ayan, meron nang mag-share ng story. May candidate na tayong isa. Stories, stories really, you know, stories, yeah. stories are more powerful than anything else. In fact, facts, facts are just there as permission to believe the story. You get it? That's what we do in advertising, right? We promise you that you will have clean dishes na happy ang, ang, tatay, ang, ang, ang asawa mo because it has solo rocks. You get it? Or active Gen E. You get it? The molecules are just there to give you permission to believe. But what we're selling is the promise. It's always the promise. It's never the, it's never the molecules. So stories are very important. Humans are very important. And uh, I think it's the last. I know you want to burn the forest with social media and so on and so forth. But in the end, what the, the best social media is really just this. You know, just this. Not social, just, just family media, whatever you want to call this. Because in the end, what we can really provide for each other is that the feeling that we are not alone. That what we're going through is, you know, someone understands because someone's going through the same thing, right? So this, this, that's the best service if you can serve, if you can, you know, if you can give service to, to each other, is that, that we are not alone, you know? That yes, we're going to this together. That is the, the real social, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's the socials, you know, that the neighbor part, the socials part, the people you can relate to. That's the family you've chosen. That's the social sphere you've chosen. So we are not alone. And if you're not alone, then things have meaning, right? So that's the, that's the most important social media you can build. So you don't have to burn the forest, but you can tend the garden. You can tend your personal little plot of land with your sage and your, <laughs> and your lavender and all these things, right? Because that's the function of social media in the end, that we are not so alone, right? That I hear you. Four things of empathy. Empathy. Hey, familiar ako sa'yo. I see we're the same. Second, hey, I know what you're going through. I feel you, sis. I feel you, di ba? Three, alam mong galing mo. Sana all. I admire you, di ba? And last is, you know, I get you because I know where you're coming from and you get me. Those four things for empathy is the most powerful thing on social media or in life in general, right? The same. Ay, pareho tayo. Taga Cebu ka, ma'am. Ang, ang papa na ako, taga Bantayan. Diba? Taga Bantayan, Cebu. Diba? So, we share something. I know what you're going. I feel you, sis. Third, 69 ka na, active ka pa. Sana all, diba? And that's the last. And now I get you, right? So those are the things that you, you must, you know, in the end, it's all about that. It's all about this. It's all about this. Thank you so much, Thank Marlon, you. for bringing it down to what really matters, right? Thank you so much. Thank you also, Tish. And um, have a good day, everybody. Meron pang maraming uh, talks. No? So stay tuned for that. Thank you so much for listening to our conversation.
hashtag CBCS Philippines and hashtag CBCS Manila.